From Screen Junkie Studios in the heart of Los Angeles, this is Screen Junkies Movie Fight. Now your host, Andy Signor. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Live Movie Fights. We're just had a wonderful break. I'm so happy to be here. We're back live with some of my favorite fighters to talk about the best of the year. Best film, best performance, best scene. Uh, a lot of stuff that we'll be breaking down in today's episode, so get excited. Uh, well, let's get right to it. If uh, I'll, Well, first, if you want to join us live and you're watching on Screen Junkies Plus, you can join the conversation on Twitter. Hashtag Movie Fights Live. Uh, we'll be there discussing it. Uh, first up, I'm so happy to have him back. He's a Writer, friend of the show, it's Mark Andrinko. Yes, and I like to promote. I've already bought my copy. I hope you guys are all pre-ordering or already did because I hear it's already on its third, third printing. printing. Yeah, wow. yeah, it came out uh, the 28th of December, and in 10 days we're on our third printing already. It's been selling out everywhere. The reviews have been great. You can get it now digitally on Amazon or Comixology, but uh, it's been overwhelming. It's weird to see a book that six months ago was just an idea come to fruition and be actually really good and the reaction has been in I only had to block four people on Twitter <laughs> wow that's, a great that's really that's, good that's, that's that's like statistically weird I think they're I all like to hiding block four people this morning yeah <laughs> um, so yeah and it's a great book and uh, we've just announced that we're doing the au auction of all the original art at Megacon in Orlando in May so that'll be another round of all dude. The I'm so there, it's so. so proud of you, and it's really good. I can't wait to read it. Um, congrats on all the success, and uh, you were on Seth Meyers. I saw you. It was so weird. It was so, <laughs> so, so weird. cute seeing Mark on there. <laughs> so weird. My you looked ten. a little nervous. Oh. <laughs> but yeah. you did great. Yeah, it was. I haven't been that nervous since I had my teeth pulled when I was like 15 years old. It was terrifying. But uh, bravo, and yes, please pick up Love Is Love uh, everywhere. Uh, next up, Roth Cornett. So happy to have you, our editor in chief, Screen Junkies News. <laughs> I dragged you in here because I knew you'd be good this week. You have a lot of passion on some of these movies, and it's going to get heated, but welcome back. Thank you. I love these movies. You did drop me here. I love these guys. Love is love, and I love both these guys, so I'm looking forward to seeing you guys battle it out. These too. are three passionate fighters. I'm excited to watch this goes, and we couldn't end it without movie man. Scott passion. Manson, the man. The man, the legend is passion. here. Passion. Give it up. Happy New Year, Screen Junkies. I love this panel. I love the show. Uh, it's my favorite thing to do is movie fights because I love everybody except one person who's not here. <laughs> who is that? Like, who is that? that person is. Yeah, who is it? But uh, should we should we call him out? Should we no. call the John Roca? John Roca? John Roca? John Roca? John Roca? Ooh. John Roca? Wow. I, I, I am putting a test because I know you guys don't really you you want you're you guys are both sick of fighting, but I'm making you guys I'm putting you to task. I, I know. John Roca, Movie Mance version three. We're gonna do it in 2017. You're We're willing? doing it. We're doing oh, it. Oh, I can't it's wait. gonna get ugly. It's one gonna on get one. One on one. One on one. One on one. One on one. Correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't Roka the one who sold me out when I was competing for Batman versus Superman? He was on my No, team. that was Campia. Oh. <laughs> John Campia. Uh, that was in the movie fights 100 moment, uh, 50 moments. If you guys haven't watched, it's available on ScreenDuckies.com. It's really fun. We look back. All these guys chimed in, uh, but it's a look back. It's a really well done. That was fun. Kudos to the team here for putting it together. 90 minute special, exclusive interviews, and, and some exclusive scenes they can't see. Uh, oh, nice. the, the, the infamous deleted scene of Dan and I uh, <laughs> that we really hated each other during. <laughs> it's, it's in there. That, that orgy scene from Guys Not Show is uncut. Uh, but we re it's a really fun special if you love movie fights. And you don't really get to see, or we haven't seen all the episodes. It really breaks down the best moments. So go check that out. Uh Dan Merle's on the couch with some special Woo! guests. Dan yeah, Merle, Dan, how's it Dan, going? Dan, Get these fans. Dan, did you have a good break? I did have a good break. Hey Dan, what was yesterday? Uh, it was January the fourth. Who, who, who was Dan's, Dan's birthday? birthday. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I didn't buy you anything. I just wanted no, to know. No, everybody here was very nice on my Surprised birthday. Surprised so I had you, a, yeah. I had a great night with my girlfriend. We went and saw my favorite movie of the year, which will be brought up on this show many times many today. Many times! I will dispassionately fact check the facts today. <laughs> uh, no, it was great. I had a great time. That was and, really uh, your favorite movie. Yeah. Yeah. So, oh, so far. Count. He really wanted to fight. Save really it. So far. Uh, all right, but on the fan cam, I wanna, I'm want very I'm so happy to have him. Three of our upcoming fan fighters. That's right. Let's introduce, on the end, Jack Shipley, yeah. Maggie Bain, and Jonathan Youngblood. Welcome, you three. Now, I want to explain to the YouTube audience how this is going to work uh, if you're if you're a Screen Junkies Plus member, we're going to be doing two semifinal fan fights this time. Last oh, year nice. we did one.
again, but this time you're going to have to earn your seat in. And then uh, for the next Friday, tomorrow, Friday, uh, if you're watching on YouTube, sorry, it already happened, but you can go watch it at screenduckies.com. Uh, Friday at 3 p.m., correct? Friday at 3 p.m. we'll be doing a special live plus exclusive semifinal where these fans are going to be fighting for a shot to their for their shot to fight in the official fan fight this year, 2017. You guys nervous? Yeah, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> but they've just literally flown in. They're here. They're geeking out. Are you guys excited to be here? Yeah. Oh, awesome. Very yeah. great. Putting really us all cool. in the same hotel was not a good no. idea. <laughs> <laughs> there was a legitimate noise complaint. <laughs> Uh, well, we're happy to have you. <laughs> but it's the first time there's been a Dungeons and Dragons noise complaint at the hotel. <laughs> uh, we're so happy to have you, and you'll, the three of you are here, and then we'll have three more fans next week's episode. They're going to be fighting Friday. The two winners from those fights, and then a special surprise, will be fighting uh, in the final live fight here at the end of the month on YouTube. I forget the date, but it's all fan, fan, all celebrating Fan Appreciation Month here on Screen Junkies. So thank you guys at home. Uh, all right, enjoy. You guys will be rotating on the couch. It's, lot, it's uncomfortable there with all of you. Uh, <laughs> But let's uh, let's get to it, guys. Yes, let's get to it. Let's get nuts. I want to fight you. You want to fight? Let him fight. Fine. Stop this fight! I'll kill you. I could do this all day. Round one. Here we go. We're gonna, we're saving the big dog. The best movie of the year is gonna be our final fight. So we got some other fights in between, but these are all great. And this one comes from Jonathan Peck on Twitter. Uh, he wants to know what was the best scene from a movie in 2016. Define the year. Tell us what the best scene was. And Mark, we're coming to you first. What was it? Um, my choice for best scene wasn't necessarily from anyone's favorite movie of the year, but I picked scene in specific, and it was the scene where Wonder Woman shows up and Batman versus Superman in her costume the first time to fight Doomsday. That was the first time for me, no matter what you think about the rest of that movie, and it does have flaws, that scene with her teaming up with Batman and Superman on screen for the first time was like... When I saw Star Wars for the first time, or when I saw E.T., it was just seeing these icons show up on screen for the first time was so great. And the audience, even though the audience was lukewarm through a lot of the movie, the audience was invigorated. Every time I saw that movie, the audience just jumped to it. And that movie makes is, has set, made me so excited to see where the what Wonder Woman's going to go as a character. It'll be interesting to see. And I just thought that was the most surprisingly cool scene of a movie that year. All right, Roth, what's your pick? I picked a scene that I don't even think is just the best scene of this year, but I think that will go down as one of the better scenes in cinema history, and I really do mean that. This scene makes the movie that I will be arguing for later, Manchester by the Sea, and that is the scene between Michelle Williams and Casey Affleck. And I, it's difficult to talk about this and fight for it without spoiling the film, which I absolutely don't want to do, um, but I will say this. It is one of the most emotionally um, impactful and riveting and honest scenes I've seen in a movie in recent history. It's raw. Um, Michelle Williams in particular, I think, has to go to a place that is so vulnerable for her personally and for her character. And it's the scene that I think sells Casey Affleck's performance in that film. It's a good performance throughout, but that is the moment that you know that what you're seeing on screen is both extraordinary and indelible. It will go down in history. It will shatter your heart if you see it. You cannot watch this moment and not be affected. This is by far the best scene of the year, no doubt. Scott. Okay, before I say what my favorite scene is, I know you don't want to spoil anything, but I have to spoil something about La La Land. So if you have not seen La La Land... Well, we'll wave. Give us a wave, the mute wave. The mute wave. Okay, so... <laughs> jazz so hands. We'll jazz hands again. Check out right right now. Do not listen to this answer, but my favorite, my favorite scene of the year, the scene of the year, and the movie of the year is the what if scene at the end of La La Land. Everybody's writing down because you all know that it is true because <laughs> this is the scene where we see what would have happened if Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone ended up together. They make it through the whole film. They have to choose between love and ambition and they do not end up together. But what if they did? Heartbreaking final moment when Emma Stone is why watching Ryan on the stage at his club, dreaming, wondering what their life would have been together. We see what their life would have been like if they had ended up together from the first kiss to building a home together, painting together, having a kid, and just being happy together. And then at the very last moment, we are back to reality. Emma Stone gives Ryan Gosling one last look. They smile at each other because they're always going to love each other. 
All right, wave. We'll call it the what if. The what if. We'll try not to spoil anymore. Okay. Spoilers talk done for now. Uh, great. Three great scenes. Uh, fight it out, guys. Um, I think uh, Manchester by the Sea is a really great movie. I think uh, watching it more than once, I think Casey Affleck is the benefit of a lot of really great acting going on around him. I think that part is written to be very passive, and I think that even though he's really good in it, I would have liked to see him excel. I couldn't agree more with you about Michelle Williams. I think she's going to be one of our. I can't wait to see her when she's seventy. She's she plays a, <laughs> she plays a woman in this movie who's this uneducated, inarticulate Southie, but still articulates her grief in such a great way. That performance is in my top five of the year. The scene, not so much because she just blows him off the screen. And the scene for me is so bleak that I don't know how many times I want to watch that. It's so well done. Um, La La Land, uh, here I, we go. I liked that scene better when it was in The Umbrellas of Cherbourg. He just lifted that scene from another movie. He did a Tarantino. He took a scene and did nothing really with it and put it back in the movie. And don't get me wrong, I did not like La La Land at all, but I went in there wanting to like it. I'm a theater major. I love musical theater. I went in there, I went in there ready to put out for that movie. So it breaks my heart that I apparently saw a movie no one else did. Of, if I had to pick a scene in that movie that I thought would have been better, it probably wouldn't have been that one because it just felt familiar. I, if you've seen the Catherine Deneuve Umbrellas of Shelbourg, I was like, I've seen this done the original time. It just left me kind of cold. You talk about about having scenes. You talk about scenes that feel like you've seen them somewhere else. Isn't that what most movies are like these days? That's a that's a poor not, argument. Not Hang like, on. not like. He lifted. He he basically transposed and just replaced the actors in the identical scene from the end of that so, movie. So if you're watching a movie like Swingers, where they mm -hmm. go into the where they go Which into be, you, you know, okay. different movies. Movie, but when they when they sort of uh, pay tribute to the scene from Goodfellas where they're going through the club, pay tribute that and that homage can't... is different from a lazy lift. It is not a lazy, lazy lift. lift. It is a scene that, felt that like wraps AFI up film the whole movie. It wraps pieces. up the whole movie. It gives the movie a heartbreaking, unforgettable feel. Ugh, it, it, I want to forget ends, the movie. It was it, two hours and wrong, ten minutes so long. Wrong. It ends the movie on a high note. I just want to say this about Manchester mm -hmm. by the Sea before I get back to you because you are absolutely wrong. <laughs> Manchester by the Sea is a great film, and we were talking about this before we came in. It is hard to argue again a movie that you love and Manchester by the Sea is absolutely on my top three of 2016 that scene is fantastic but it's not I can't really argue why that scene isn't strong I can only argue why I love the what if scene at the end of La La Land more it's a it's a great moment they could have just she they could have just walked into the club he could have seen uh, Ryan Gosling performing and that would have been the end of it but there's a scene where you always wonder what if I had chosen love path, yes. over ambition well I'm glad it worked for you because I thought they had negative it charisma for a I lot thought they of had people. zero chemistry that's fine it a lot of people like Velveeta I'm not a fan of Velveeta either that's not a valid argument on quality it's not even a wide release yet the movie is connecting on a romantic level the way that Titanic I think the connected. movie's connecting the same way that Brief History of Time is connecting lots of people say they read it or saw it but not many people did I just thought it was oh, the I most disagree empty with that. I completely disagree I thought it was the most that. empty pretentious and the movie we'll have plenty of time to argue the merits of La La Land I think throughout this whole fight. Uh, I'd love to hear from you, Rod. And also, I, I haven't heard anything against uh, uh, Wonder Woman. Uh, actually, that's what I wanted to address because I loved Wonder Woman in Batman v Superman. I loved seeing her come out there and it was such an elated moment, but this is the problem with that. It's a moment. It's not a scene. It's, oh, it's no, really, when you think no. about what a scene is and what it is meant to do, if you took that moment into an acting class, for example, what would happen? The actress would come out and pull out a sword and try to look like amazing. You know, if you take uh, and, and there, where, where's there the, where be, is the what is the acting class motif? There, scene there will be. This, there, this is what I'm trying to say. A scene is a complete. It has a beginning, middle, and an end. It is something that you can lift out, and it is complete story unto itself. That's not true. That scene that, in your movie, though. Absolutely, if you don't know, the, if you don't know the rest absolutely. of the movie, that but scene is completely out of context. But you get the essence of what was happening between them. I could pull out that scene right now, and I guarantee you that actors for the rest of eternity will be trying to capture and the magic. And acting teachers are cringing about that possibility. The magic of what will be happening in that scene forever. Wait, about Manchester or La La Land? No, acting teachers are desperately avoiding hoping this ever comes to their and class. They, because they're going to see this for a hundred years. That's true. And the reason why is because it is that good. Things that you see for a hundred years. I just years, think your scene is uneven. They capture I, something. I think it's a great scene. I don't agree, and I'll tell you why. It is something that it captures something completely relatable and completely true for human beings who have experienced grief. What you said is so true. She communicates what grief is and, and I'll get into this later, what the movie is about in that movement, movie moment. And as far as Casey Affleck is concerned, it is a very precise 
incredibly understated performance that would be easy to dismiss. And But Michelle Williams in that moment, you're right, that is the moment we understand why this is one of the greatest actresses of our age. I think she so overpowers him. She was, It was that moment in particular that made me realize his performance was fine. Okay, I have to say this about, about uh, Batman that was Superman, a diatribe. the Wonder Woman scene. <laughs> I, first of all, the movie is not good. So even That a wasn't good the question moment, either. But wait, wait, the best scene. Let me finish. <laughs> Let me finish. The movie is not good, so even a good moment Neither would is your be movie. overblown. It would be overblown, like, oh, thank God, a good thing finally happened. But I agree with Roth. It's a great moment. It does not signify a great scene. And I will say this about Manchester by the Sea. Again, I can't argue against that scene because she is forgiving him, and he is saying, don't forgive me. I mean, the grief in that movie Beautiful. is unforgettable. But... But the scene in La La Land, the what if scene, how many people who have ever been in right. love, even I love just it. a I little love bit, I want to hear. Wonder, what if I had stayed I get with it. this woman that I love? I, you, I get it. No, I'm not discrediting that. I just need last thoughts here against the other ones. All three of you actually did pick great scenes, so don't sell me on your scene. Okay. Last thought I, I, going through. We can start with you. Go ahead. Okay. But knock down the other two one more time in your closing. Okay, again, okay, the Wonder Woman scene, it's not a scene, it's a moment in a mediocre film. It's a good moment, not a great one. Manchester by the Sea, it's a powerful moment, but it's a bit of a downer where the scene in La La Land is, it's heartbreaking and powerful and unforgettable, and that's the scene in the film. Whether or not people think they, they saw it from, another, from this other movie that most people probably have not seen, it's still a great moment in that film. There was no other moment like that in any film throughout 2016. Rob, okay. final thoughts? I also love La La Land, but I will have to agree with Mark that that is not only just an extended sequence, really. Also, they almost have pro opposite problems. This is a moment, that's an extended sequence more than it is a fully encapsulated scene that expresses something un in unto itself without context. And it is lifted, it is entirely lifted. It's very well lifted, but it's lifted. This is something that is brand new, it is unique, <laughs> it is well written, it is simple. It just presents a heart-wrenching piece of emotional truth. That is a scene that is a moment, it's a great moment, and that's a fun sequence. This is the scene of the year. Well, Mark? I would, I would agree with you on the part about La La Land. It, the, it's, not a, it's not an original scene. It is directly, it's directly lifted. It's not homage or wink, wink, nudge, nudge. It's basically a tracing of an existing scene. And I would, I would say, I would, I would give it to you if I thought that Casey Affleck didn't feel completely out of his league in that in that scene. She is such a good actress that she could have been talking to this coffee cup and I would have cried. He just it just felt to me a very uneven scene. And I disagree about there's this isn't might not be a scene written by Ibsen in Batman v Superman, but it was an emotional scene every time I saw it. The audience was more the audience was more engaged and more excited at that moment when she comes in and that whole sequence of them fighting Doomsday with Wonder Woman under last all that stuff. The audience it felt like I was in the eighties watching a Steven Spielberg movie with an audience that reacted because the emotion and the excitement was there. So it might not be emotional in the context of that, but as an audience group experience, that was unlike any I had all, all year. So. Whew, all right, I love you three. That was that was a fun fun fight. Three great fighters. Dan, any cleanup? Uh, well, I mean, factually not much. Cleanup, but as you would imagine online, so many people have different opinions. Uh, uh, he, uh, the most popular one, uh, Caleb Coho, was the first one, that, one of the first ones, the airport scene from Civil War. Uh, David <laughs> Bowman said the, suggested the last scene from Hell or High Water. Probably the second most important, uh, uh, popular one, Patricia Carrillo, and many others suggested the Darth Vader scene, unleashed scene from Rogue One. Oh, that was fun. Uh, Viola <laughs> Davis' scene in Fences from Dean mm -hmm. Lentini. Uh, uh, Would That It Tour So Simple, Megan W. Yep. from Hail Caesar. Love that one. And uh, Evan Coyne suggested the sloth scene from Zootopia. I saw Mr. <laughs> Shipley here tweeting what, during the round. He had his own choice as well. Uh, I think the best scene is Captain America, Bucky, and uh, Iron Man's fight at the end of Civil War as opposed to the airport scene because there's more stakes actually involved in that fight versus the airport scene, which is really just a good, entertaining scene. And the Twitter poll is currently a tie, so I'll let you judge, and maybe Ooh. by the time you've oh. given your ruling, the Twitter poll will have a two-way two tie. Okay. <laughs> maybe the Twitter poll will have uh, resolved itself. Look, uh, this, the, you, I, I think you all actually legitimately picked three good moments, uh, scenes, uh, moments, scenes, however we're defining them. They all were counted, and they all are fair. Um... I think you uh, marked a really good job at knocking Scott down in that the the stealing of it is is kind of a of a bummer that that takes that away. Um, so that coupled with uh, I just think you I think Roth and Mark uh, made stronger arguments as to their scenes playing more uh, versus it is a very long sequence. It's a long part, um, and you were 
counting it all versus any specific moment in it or, or part of it. So it came down to Mark and Roth for me. Um, and then I, I did see you. You sort of were giving her the point through most of the round. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> Pointing I to the it. So I love the scene. <laughs> that, that coupled with you even sort of admitting uh, Casey, it was just came down to Casey Affleck wasn't very good, but I thought um, them talking about how the movie wasn't very good and that, that helps define the scene. I got to give it to Roth just based on the off the, off the debate. I have no problem with that. <laughs> Wins. But uh, very close. All right. Uh, Roth always wins. Round uh, two. Well, quickly, I, 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 I want to say, I'm going to refresh it one more time to see if this tie has been broken. Let's see as it reloads. It has been broken right now. 41% voted for Wonder Woman uh, fighting Doomsday. 40% voted for La La Land. And Manchester by the Sea took 19%. I'm the Hillary Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Those are both I'm great. the Bernie Sanders. Three great scenes. Great that scenes. was too easy. <laughs> I love that Wonder Woman moment. Those are great moments. Round two. All right, this one comes in from Logan Adair on Twitter, uh, who wants to ask, what is the best performance of 2016? Oh boy. Uh, and this time we're starting with you, Roth. All Who right. are you picking? So I am picking Ashton Sanders from Moonlight. Moonlight, pardon me. <clears throat> this is tough. Some great performances this year. And in this film alone, the entire cast needs all of the available awards. Mahershala Ali is the one who's getting a lot of the acclaim, right? But I, when I think about that film and I think about the performance that has the largest arc, it's this one, and I, I don't know if you guys have seen the film. Um, I hope you have. If you haven't, go see it. Um, but he plays Chiron, which is, so the film is told in three parts, just in case you don't know. He's a young boy, he's a teenager, and then he's a man. So this is the middle part where he's a teenager. And what's amazing to me about this performance is that he starts and you can see the edges of that young boy and who that boy was. And then he takes a kind of a journey and he loses his innocence in a couple of different ways, and one of them is sexual, and it's kind of lovely and nice, and then he is brutally betrayed, and he loses this emotional innocence. And by the end of it, he turns, and he takes a turn, and you see the man that he's gonna become. And what's so amazing about that is that the film wouldn't work if you didn't see that arc, because you wouldn't believe that these three people were the same person because on the surface they're very very different beings but you understand through this performance why and that it is one man it's extraordinary this kid deserves the biggest career ahead of him i i, I really can't i really can't recommend the movie enough i'm making his point for later <laughs> But the performance is what I'm really recommending. Well, it just proves we all have like, adjacent <laughs> complimentary taste. This is, this is except a very, for your love of La La Land. Except for that. But, but he's Scott. funny. He's funny. So that well, guess what? Guess what? Oh, guess Jesus who God. my favorite performance of the year is? Let's hear it for Emma Stone. <laughs> Emma Stone in La La Land. I fell in love with Emma Stone in Easy A. I fell in love with her even more in The Help, in Birdman. She is an actress who is constantly taking on challenges, doing big, brave, bold performances. As Mia in La La Land, she is the heart and soul of this film. She does so much in one movie. She has to do drama. She has to do comedy. She has to do love. She has to be upset. She has to fall on her face. She has to sing. She has to dance. That is a lot. That is a lot. She did more in this movie than other people did in five or six films. And she is the heart and soul of this film. The last look that she gives to Ryan Gosling, without saying a word, she says everything that she feels. It is a far more demanding role than a lot of people give it credit for because it's kind of a comedy, because it's a musical, because it's not deep like Moonlight or Manchester by the Sea, but it is deep. It is very, very deep. And her one take single scene where she is singing Here's to the Fools Who Dream is worth the price of admission. Mark. Um, I, my original choice for best performance was, echoed Ross, was the cast of Moonlight, because for me it was just impossible. If I didn't know two of those actors, were, their work beforehand, I would have thought I was watching the most intimate documentary I've ever seen. That movie, I got physically uncomfortable watching some scenes because I was like, I shouldn't be here. This is a private moment. Um, so, but I do think he was great. I thought all, I thought the casting in this movie, this is a movie that makes, shows you why there should be Oscars for casting, because you believe in all three sections of this movie that they're, 
it's insane. But we'll right, get it's to almost that. more believable than Boyhood, and Boyhood yeah, is real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boyhood is crazy. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it but, is um, like but there were there were a number of performances, and I thought there were some big ones that are the obvious choices. And there was a performance that came out at the beginning of the year from one of our greatest actresses, and it was a return to form and showed. Unlike Meryl Streep, who as she is getting older keeps taking bigger and bodier and broader roles, this performance was so big on the surface, but such a real, fully realized person. It was uh, Sally Field and Hello, My Name is Doris. Um, I went into this expecting, oh, she's a quirky old lady, and it's by Mike, it's a, by, um, Mike Showalter. It's going to be kind of cynical and mean, and it was delightful. It was right in her wheelhouse. She plays this woman who lived with her mother and her mother was a hoarder the mother died and she's worked doing data entry at this company for 20 years and she meets max greenfield on an elevator and starts concocting this relationship he's friendly to her and it could have easily been a bad first wives club tuck type sort of knockoff thing and it's a really poignant smart movie and throughout the whole movie watching sally field do what she does better than anyone but bring a freshness to it i kept thinking this movie there's no way this movie's going to stick the landing this movie's going to end up it's going to be twee or it's going to be cynical and the ending of this movie is perfect it's a real shame that she's not getting any accolades this year because it's a performance for the ages it, it is it really did I, I, when i saw it i said to my friend wow she's like a national treasure why doesn't she do more because it's such a belief and when someone on that level of celebrity you forget you're watching a huge star you forget you're watching sally field you believe that she's this fragile woman doris and in a year that had tons of great performances this one i'd like to shine a little spotlight on because it was so good and everyone should see the movie all right find it out guys okay here's why first of all hello my name is doris Underappreciated, underseen film. We talked about it on mm -hmm. Dance Labyrinth, uh, which is a good plug for Screen Junkies Plus. So please watch the uh, Dance Labyrinth. <laughs> Thank underseen, you, Underappreciated movies of 2016. He's not voting though. <laughs> I love this film, but it's a sweet movie. It's a nice film. It's funny. It's got a heart. But ultimately, and you're right, Sally Field hasn't had a really strong lead performance in like decades. And it was great to see her back doing what she does best because we really love her. But it is not a role that required her to do as much or go as deep or be as well-rounded as Emma Stone in oh. in La La Land. And, and uh, 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 Ashton, Sanders, Ashton, Stan, Ashton, Ashton Sanders, <laughs> Ashton Sanders in Moonlight, it, it is a great performance. It is a supporting performance. It doesn't... Uh, it, it, the whole film doesn't depend on that performance. But, well, oh. hang on, hang on. A lot of it does, but not all of it. He's he's one third of this character. I felt like Mahershala Ali actually gave a better performance. And it's Same ironic that you said one third of a character because Emma Stone played one third of a character. No, that's <laughs> absolutely not true. That was a fully realized oh character in every sense oh of the word. Oh my god, she can't one sing. Of she these can't actors, dance. No, she can sing. She fucking killed. She absolutely I you killed. Like my too, Here's didn't to you? the full who drink. Yeah, it's her latest moment and she earned it, she killed it, she crushed it. She killed music, yeah. <laughs> I disagree. She oh, was terrific. She was the best thing in that movie, but by no means is that a And compliment. she is a trained singer because she did cabaret on Broadway, so she, she knows how to sing and she did a great job at it. Rebecca Remain did Chicago on Broadway. I don't know. Uh, so we're not that talking about Rebecca Remain. Being She's on not Broadway, Broadway, Tony Danza was on Broadway too. That doesn't mean you're a good actor. Man, sorry. I guess we're not getting Tony Danza, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Rock. I had my, yeah, I had my hopes set on Tony Danza. <laughs> He's the boss. I was so taken with this. Um, I, I, God, I love that movie. I love, I love. My name is Doris, and I, and I love Sally Field. Um, and and I think you're right that she she did a great job in La La Land. I will say this. Why I think my performance is the best performance of the year <laughs> is, it, and it harkens back to something we were talking about earlier. I think a lot of times when we award actors, it's because we really see their acting. We're like, look at them acting. I am acting, you know, and it's so big and it's so in your face and you can't help but notice that yep. they're acting. But what you said about this film and about this performance is really true. You don't notice. You're, you're uncomfortable. You really feel like you're watching life unfold before you. Um, the raw moments in someone's life that they would write in their diary about and then burn because they never want anyone to know that they felt that feeling or that shame or that embarrassment or that elation or whatever it is that is too personal to share with any other being. You feel like you're seeing that as you watch this movie and it's a narrative film so I think nothing could sell the strength of the performances in total in this movie more than that feeling and this one to me is a hundred percent necessary the movie does rest on it because when you walk out of that movie you go you would never believe that that little boy became that man unless that teenager 
sold you on it. The movie falls apart without that performance. Well, I think I agree it's a great performance. My problem with it is it's really hard to take one performance. All the actors that were triple cast, it's all it's all parts of a meal and to remove one piece of it makes it feel uneven otherwise I think all three parts are equally necessary to see Chiron's full growth and this is once again not I think that's a spectacular movie I w if I had to pick one performance in the movie that I thought was better it would have been I can't pronounce his first name Ali Mahershala, Mahershala. Mahershala Ali. Ali because in 15 minutes it's like the Judy Dench moment in Shakespeare in Love yeah. he just I mean, shows up and takes a character a drug dealer in the project and transforms it into something I've never seen before but what you said you used my own words kind of against me on the performance and that, I feel it's even more important with Sally Field because Sally Field's a big damn movie star and when I watched that movie, I forgot that this was Sally Field. I like, you know, you like me, you really like me or Forrest Gump or whatever she's done. I completely bought into this woman and this performance could have been broad on paper and in the posters. You're like, oh, she's Daffy and has stuff on her desk and it's such a heartfelt performance. The moment when she and Max, when she reveals to Max Greenfield what she thinks of their relationship. I was so nervous for her because I knew what he was going to say, and I got—I mean, I got, I got goosebumps right now. You're so invested in her, and afterwards, Sally Field's one of the biggest. She's one of our biggest stars that we have still, and I forgot it was Sally Field, and she brings immense baggage. She's going to carry you like me. You all, you really like me for the rest of her days, <laughs> and I just think and that Gidget. I just think and Gidget, Gidget and flying nine, Smokey uh, the Bandit, yeah. and all that stuff. Hey, well, hooray, hooray, baby! <laughs> but I think, but I, I like think that the I think that in, as far like as reality too. goes, I think that. <laughs> This performance trumps that one a little just because of the caliber of star. And with your performance, I think Emma Stone is a great actress. I thought she was given very little to play. I thought she was the best thing in the movie. I just thought these characters were paper thin. Oh. And and she and that, that that one woman show she puts on, she deserves to not be famous for that. <laughs> I've seen so many bad North Hollywood one woman shows. I knew exactly what that was. She couldn't sell that at all. Um, I thought she was fighting against the movie. I thought I wanted to see the movie she thought she was in. Okay, that is. I heard enough. What? Oh, okay. Oh, are you Dan. Doris? Yes, Dan. Uh, again, factually, not so much to uh, to argue. Just uh, again, people watching live on Movie Fights Live. Sean Blanford uh, gave some love to Ben Foster and Hella High Water. Mm -hmm. The number one choice, Dwayne Joseph Burke, and many people said Ryan Reynolds as Deadpool. They thought he owned that character and that movie. Daniel Radcliffe getting a lot of love for yeah, Swiss Army really? Man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now you see too. Uh, Billy Pollahan <laughs> and a lot of others watching home said Denzel Washington and in, in Fences. Billy. Paul uh, Aaron Taylor Johnson and Nocturnal Animals mm. getting some love. Yeah, Andrew Garfield and Hacksaw Ridge also. And uh, a few, including Corey L. Williams, who's watching. Uh, Margot Robbie said, uh, you know, think what you want about the movie, but Margot Robbie was a great performance. So uh, a lot of choices, as that's always. Actually a really, that's a really good list. That's, yeah. a, all that's those, a great all, list. All, all those could almost, almost, almost all those could be Ryan Reynolds, actually. Um, but, you know, unlike uh, the last poll, I do have a winner in the Twitter poll, which I will reveal, Andy, after your ruling. I don't think, uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm probably going against Twitter poll in this. I think, uh, I just think Mark crushed in his final argument. He really made a good point about how uh, you used your own argument against you, um, and uh, it was just too hard to, to go by. Uh, the fact that it was Sally Field going against type, uh, all the things you said, I got to give it to Mark. Oh, wow. Okay. See that movie. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Ultimately, yeah. ultimately, that's why I chose it because more people need to watch. People you can do watch need it to watch that. It's, so it's a good. really good performance. Yeah. And yeah. Who sold me. won the Twitter uh, poll there? Uh, the Twitter poll was Stone, right? a runaway. Fifty-six <laughs> percent chose Emma Stone. Again, it's, it's well, yeah, it's good, but it, again, Twitter. She's never going to date only, you guys. It's the widest release yes. and it's the most famous name. Yes. That's why this is not a scientific but there were poll. Very good arguments made in terms of rebuttals like her Broadway performance and that she can't sing. That was yes, very good there were a lot of good performances. Yeah, it, see, she's taking notes. Good. <laughs> wow. She's, this is going to be a good fan fights. Um, There's going to be chairs over people's heads. Uh, oh, but yeah. anyway, good all around. Uh, but uh, Mark has the point. All right, moving on to round three. This should be fun. Uh, what is the most overrated movie of 2016? Oh, here we go. <laughs> Man, I'm saving this. this. This this movie fight is going to give a lot of press <laughs> for La La Land. I'm going to call right. Lionsgate right now. Scott, you get, was so you get good to go this first. Year. Okay, going first with a movie that I went into with massive expectations because not just it is a sequel to a great film, but because of the brand that it comes from. Pixar, I'm going with Finding Dory, a movie that sinks 
fast. I did not like Finding Dory. Pixar has done so well, but in the, in the sequel game, it has failed Aww. miserably. I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> you know, you had me with those big eyes. Look at those big Aww. eyes. Oh my gosh. But listen, Cars 2 sucked. Uh, Monsters University sucked. Finding Dory sucked. There's no story. It's The pacing is sluggish. There's no creativity. It doesn't have the depth, the intelligence, the wit, and the charm of Finding Nemo, which came out in May of 2003. Uh, the whole short-term memory thing has been played out. Uh, just Finding Dory just falls short of Pixar's extremely high standards, and that's my argument. And especially, what was the last one? Um, Inside Out was their last movie? Inside Out was awesome. Inside Out, one of their arguably one of the best movies they ever made. I completely agree. Yeah. Oh my god, will you agree? Huh? <laughs> it was well, very, I'm, I'm it was very short. short <laughs> I'm not going to agree with either of you on that. Mark. Oh. Okay, Mark, let's see how long he uh. agrees. <laughs> I can't. I just can't. Well, you're going to have to. I can't. <laughs> La La Land. Ah! <laughs> Every year there's a movie oh. <laughs> that we see and we wonder, was I in a pocket universe <laughs> while everyone else saw this movie that they're just all having spontaneous ecstatic orgasm over? I went into this movie. I like Ryan Gosling. I like Emma Stone. I thought Whiplash, J.K. Simmons was great in it. Um, so I went into it expecting to love it, because I think this is a great idea. We need to do, we need to update musicals instead of remaking the same three over and over again. I thought, when, when Roger Ebert reviewed Wild Wild West, he said that he didn't believe that Will Smith and Kevin Klein were ever in the same scene together. They spliced them together. They had more chemistry than Emma Stone and Ryan, Ryan Gosling in this movie. I, I couldn't believe this was their third movie together. It seemed like, one, he was playing it like her creepy father, not a boyfriend. And this movie has, the thing that did this, besides the fact that it forgets it's a musical for an hour in its three hour running length, it's actually 210, don't worry, I, you know, fact check that. Um, it's a movie that, that makes me know why Fox News watchers hate California, especially Los Angeles. Oh my God! Because these, these two people were such vapid, white, pow, white entitlement, shallow stereotypes. <laughs> the looks in this room. It drove me crazy. <laughs> Once again, you have Emma Stone. My, minor spoiler alert. They're both losers. She oh, my God. Job. He can't help at a restaurant. He gets a job with his buddy who's paying him a lot of money to make music, which puts you at the top of the food chain statistically. She comes back because no one wants to see her shitty one-woman show in North Hollywood and yells at him, you've sold out, which is, once again, white liberal privilege telling us the nobility of being poor. This was a $40 million movie, and none of them fly coach, so don't talk to me about the nobility of being poor. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Then, yeah, and then the idea of her of selling out is so reprehensible to her until she gets her job in her big studio film. So she's a fucking hypocrite. This movie, I was bored by this movie when I saw it, and every time I see an ad talking about how it's vibrant and exciting and full of life, I want to punch this you movie in the throat. Soul. This you movie is the most... This movie makes me watch American Dad. She tips so well, I the feel shop for you. you. Oh, fuck you. Sick, fuck everyone in this movie. Sad, unfortunate human being. All right, Roth, before oh we get into God. this. <laughs> I can go all night. Roth. Oh, this, my God. This is amazing, but I actually have the most overrated movie of the year. For real. And that's Sully, people. Okay, let me talk about this. We love Tom Hanks, right? <laughs> I love Tom Hanks. Who doesn't love Tom Hanks? So you put Tom Hanks in a made-for-TV movie and suddenly it deserves all kinds of accolades. This movie has no dramatic tension. The premise of the movie is maybe he made a mistake. Nope, he didn't. It has one great crash sequence that then they basically return to in a series of simulations. They're like, maybe we should see the simulation if a fembot did it. Let's do that the simulation awesome. <laughs> make it. Perhaps we should see the simulation in Sanskrit. How many ways can we return to this fight, the fight sequence because that is the only thing that this, besides Tom Hanks, that this movie has on tap. There is nothing... Clint Eastwood is an amazing talent, but he's so old. And he does like one take, y'all. One, and then he's like, we're good. We got I, it. We're good. Keep I going. I gotta take a nap. And he started, <laughs> you gotta go talk to a chair. You gotta go talk to a chair for a minute. He started doing that way back 
he did uh, Perfect World with Kevin Costner. And Kevin said, Clint, I need to do a couple more takes to get it right. He said, no. And then Kevin said, I'm going to do it. And Clint said, no, there's two men in the world that can tell you no. And, and I want to know. And Dawn. That was then. Now we're lucky if we get one take out of the movie. To actually get something on screen, there is nothing in that movie other than Tom Hanks, who, yes, we all love, and a crash sequence. Spoiler alert. All right, which all right. one's more offensively overrated? <laughs> First of all, I agree with everything Rod said about Sully. It was a movie in search of a story. It was a moment in search of a, of a complete film. It was a cool moment. It was Go a watch cool the moment. history you just want to watch them. But, but the thing is about it being overrated, I don't know if it was overrated because I didn't. I never saw it as being an overrated movie to begin with. It came out <clears> It came out Labor Day weekend or the, or the weekend after Labor Day weekend. Go ahead. If I may, not only did the, the AARP award it, which oh. I think <laughs> We should, by the way, tell us everything about what's to come. What did the Christian Science Monitor say? But that's what I'm saying. The AIFRP awarded this movie because it's so old. But then exactly. the AFI put it in the top ten. This is where I draw umbrage, people. The AFI then put it in the top ten of the year. What are you talking about? That's because they want the Tom Hanks to speak choice, at their And this is your people, sir. The Chris Choice okay, yeah. <laughs> nominated it for Best Picture, a number of national board and of it review. Lost. Now, and it, it lost. And it was what? nominated, Wait a minute. What it won? Was nominated, what won sir. Best Picture at the Critics' Choice Awards? But my point is, fucking La La Land won. La La So did Crash, La by the way. Land. So did Crash. All right, no, no, thank you, Ross. Good. Oh, your Chris movie counts. Accolades. What you were gonna say about why it was why Finding Dory was worse? Okay, Finding Dory is worse because. It was first of all, it's ninety four percent on Rotten Tomatoes. No way is it that good. No way is it that good. And, you know, all these critics said that mm, Finding Dory. La La Land on Rotten Tomatoes. Not, you know what, La La Land. I'm telling you, on February twenty sixth, it's going to win the Oscar for Best Picture. And that doesn't mean I may it's not a good be proven movie. right now, but I will be proven on February twenty sixth. It landed on number one. Uh, all these critics and critics groups and and uh, uh, voting groups put it as their favorite movie of the year. The old white voting block. What do you feel? Wait, the way you feel about La La Land, I respect your opinion, but it is the minority opinion. It is it not, it's not overrated. Valid. It's just an opinion. It does not make so it overrated. Let me let me just say something here really quickly for a minute. And I think that we're all going to be in agreement about this. A, the majority opinion in any given moment can change about a film or about sure anything. Can. Crash also won Best Picture. And many people now, including the director of Crash, by the way, said it was not deserved. Second is that an opinion that something is not good doesn't mean that it's overrated necessarily versus Sully, which I think we can all agree is an okay TV movie, should not be on the top 10 of the year from the freaking AFI. That is overrated. That is the definition of overrated. It is just a so-so uh, movie I would that have, got accolades because of the people attacked. But I have to agree with Scott on this, that uh, Sully for me got good reviews and it was a critical hit, but I haven't seen it on other than other than those. I haven't seen a number Tom Hanks of awards. critical awards. I haven't seen anything for best director, any of that. I think that movie, I the place. I think it's true, so I'm gonna oh, just I'm, do I'm this for the sake. But I'm saying for the sake, I think Sully is is out. <laughs> it's between Scott and Mark, so I'd like just a couple more closings for the sake of oh, running late. Can I say something me? about Dory then? And yeah, then, you can, can fight. Support but, Mark. Yeah, uh, um, go ahead, but I just think out of these yeah. three, I think they both sort of uh, did a soft, <laughs> not, I'm not going to call it an official knockout, but it was a soft uh, elimination. Uh, but yes, you can say one last thought if you want it against. Okay, so this is just about Dory, and this isn't because I don't love La La Land, but I will say this about Dory, because I've seen it get a lot of flack, and, and, and take this as you will, because it's a little bit personal, um, but when I was young, I had learning disabilities. And to me, Dory, and I wrote about it, and it's up on my Twitter, so this is all public. To me, Dory was a movie that captured better than almost any children's movie I ever saw about how to deal with a child that was struggling with any kind of limitation, because it told you how to tell them that could be their strength. And what I found in my life is that my biggest struggles, including that, eventually became my biggest strengths. Okay, I, I love that you you connected and related to the movie on but that But I think note. other kids probably did too. But I just feel like in general, the the finding, uh, the, the short-term memory disorder has been completely played out in this film series, worked perfectly in Finding Nemo in 2003, and then that movie's over, and then then it's done. I just felt like all the other things about Finding Dory, like it, it, it they tried to move it the, the pacing very fast because they were trying to uh, they they were trying to cover up the fact that the movie just did not have a strong story. It did not have the wit, the intelligence, the smarts, or even just the laugh out loud humor 
of Finding Nemo. Yeah. And as far as as far as La La Land goes, it is the best movie of the year. It's a throwback, but not too much of a throwback. It's current and it is contemporary. It walks a fine line straight through. The fact that Damien Chazelle can follow up a film like Whiplash with something so completely different that does play into his love of the obscure films the musicals, the French films that, like the one that you mentioned before, which I didn't remember the name of because I never saw the movie. I just liked that scene, the what if scene for what it was in the context of that film, not because it was quote unquote lifted from something else. But he well, didn't create it. You're gonna, you're, that, that's like buying a bootleg video and saying it was really, really cool. So you're gonna take a look at Quentin Tarantino, all eight of his freaking films and say they are all shit because he lifted so many No, but I think it's a problematic movies. thing. I think, he, I think it's a very problematic thing, but we're not talking about Quentin Tarantino. You know, we're talking about La La Land now because you guys have had a, a lot of time to talk, so I'm going to take some time here. Go La La it. Land, <laughs> to me, felt like the suggestion of movies. It felt like its, pre, its ambitions were hobbled by its pretense. The writing of these characters is so paper thin. You have them talking about jazz. There's a scene where he's talking about jazz in the club, and arguably the only true jazz musicians in the, in the movie are playing, and he's talking over them to mansplain jazz to Emma Stone, who... Well, he's, with a joke, with a joke out of 1994, says, "Oh, I like Kenny G. That's the best screenplay of the year. A Kenny G joke." Just with Rosie O'Donnell on the bill. He has a passion. Oh, Mark, oh, he has a passion. He has a passion that she is not familiar with. I am a listen. Just to, just to show you she how much a, I know. There's no passion in this movie. It was the most bloodless character. movie I've ever minute. seen. And I, I, and I you know what? No, you got you had go your ahead, you had ahead, your time. Go. Go you had ahead, your time. Go. You can respond to this. But the th the biggest problem for me was, and I once again, I went into this movie wanting to like it. This was I was like, this is a blind date. I waxed, I put on cologne, I did everything. I was ready to go. And this movie was just so lifeless. And if you're gonna if you're gonna do homage, if we're gonna even just give Chazelle the idea, you know, that we're gonna give him the, the pass on the umbrellas of Cherbourg ending and stuff, if you're gonna do homage to a great movie, you better be all just as good as that movie. You better not make me think, God, I wish I, I wish I was watching the movie he lifted this from. Because I like both these actors. I liked Whiplash. On paper, this should have added up, but it is a lifeless and inert. Overrated. It's like it's the it's the art house equivalent of a Nancy Myers film. When it's white people porn. Okay. When you were talking, you keep talking about oh, it's white people, it's white people, it's white people. You know what? So what? So Emma Stone, Ryan Gosling are white people. First of all, and jazz is I can't a black remember the last form. time I cannot remember the last time I saw a movie that made me feel really, really love and make me feel really proud to be in this city for the last oh twenty five years. It, it made, made me, me love Los someone. Angeles even more. I love the way it was shot. I love the locations he shot it. And by the way, the moment when Ryan Gosling is trying to explain his love of jazz to Emma Stone. Yelling at her. I, wait, hang on. I'm a massive... I thought he was going to cut her. I am a massive, massive, massive fan of the Beatles. My wife is not. She still isn't, but she loves that I love the Beatles because it makes me happy, just like jazz made Ryan Gosling happy. You're projecting so much of your deeply satisfying life onto a deeply unsatisfying movie, and I, I get that. I was you very your satisfied. Own experience to it. The film this, got no, it right. I complimented the film his got life. It right. I didn't slam your. I'm not slamming your personal. The film I'm, got it right. I'm, I'm glad I this connected, connected to it with you. on so many freaking levels. And, uh, because it got it right. I'm not it trying to not make you connect to it. And magical and exhilarating. I found every word written about this movie putting it on a high mountain to be such utter bullshit and such master but I don't believe anybody saw this movie I think they just heard that it was good and like, okay, oh, that's well, why it's like said. the highest grossing uh, 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 Once independent again, film of the year that doesn't, Jurassic Park Is made 1.6 right, billion right. dollars that doesn't make or one Jurassic right. World that doesn't make okay. money doesn't make a good movie I can listen to this all day I'm having fun <laughs> <laughs> I need to hear a little bit against Finding Dory though well, Finding Dory is just the, the last in a number of times with, with, with the last good sequel Pixar made was Toy Story 3. And after everyone since then, they've been diminishing returns and it breaks my heart. This new Disney where it's like one Pixar, one Star Wars, two Marvel and a Disney animation is going to kill these companies that need three or four years to make movies. And it just feels like we got to put one out there. They get to make Inside Out and then Disney says, you got one for you. Now there's one for us. And then you find in Dory because they can sell all those more toys and Ellen can dance about it for six months on her show. And I, I just thought Finding Dory, I'm not a huge fan of Finding Nemo to begin with. I think it's fine. But Finding Dory made, made me look, think Finding Nemo was Scott's view of La La Land. It made me think it was a good movie. And it's just, and like I said, the Dory character, I love the, the special needs thing and the, the learning disability thing. That's something I never would have thought of. And that's actually really cool that it connected that way. But I just found her character so annoying. That three second thing, it was, it was like a Weekend at Bernie sort of motif. The joke got so tired. So you're saying it's under overrated? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, mine's better. <laughs> well, you didn't help your argument there, Mark. 
Thanks, closing buddy. thoughts. I'll give you one more chance. I'm, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm, sure, I'm showing them. I'm showing them. Why is La La Land? We're, so we're going back. Why is Finding Dory more overrated than La La Land? I'm going to come back to you. Why is La La Land more overrated? Than well, them? put simply, La La Land is not overrated. La La, La La Land is as good as everyone is saying it is, or most people are saying it is. I love this film. I've seen it eight friggin' times, and I love it more and more every time I see it. How many times have you seen it? I'm just curious. La La Land? Yeah. Twice. Okay. I gave it a second shot both times in the theater. Okay, I've seen every time I see the movie, I love it more and more. I find more to love about it every time I see it. I, I can't remember the last time. The last time I saw a film more than eight times, it had the words Star Trek in the title. And that I love this movie. I love <laughs> this movie. And I just feel like... Finding Dory, like when I saw it, I was like, meh, I think you were at the same screening that I was at the L Cap. And then when I saw it, like everyone was falling over themselves. And of course, a movie like that's going to do well at the box office because it's a family film. But all the praise it was getting, the publicist on this movie, okay, all right, the publicist on this film, which film? told me on Finding Dory, okay. told me in confidence, oh, I cannot, good. I'm glad they told you in confidence. I cannot believe, we, we can't track that person down I cannot what you believe. Said. The movie did as well as it did. I cannot believe critics liked it as much as they did. We were worried. That makes it overrated. Because of the because of, because they I have a nervous publicist. They have a nervous argument. publicist made things overrated. This entire city is overrated. <laughs> All right, final thought. Um, I think I think Finding Dory is a lesser sequel in the pantheon of Pixar. Yes, but I don't think it's overrated. I don't think it, people went into it. People have been trained by the mediocre sequels. They're like, oh, it's fine. La La Land. Just the the hosannas this movie is getting. You would think this movie cured cancer. And even if you think the movie is good, it's not a best picture movie. People talked about talk about how the artist won best picture and how that was utterly forgettable and a trifle. This is even more shallow than the artist. This movie has no subplots. You thought the artist was has, shallow? Has no, no, I didn't, but there's a lot, there's a huge backlash to artists. This, but this movie, there's no subplots, there's no other characters, there's barely two characters in the lead. It's like, he likes jazz and she's, she can't act and that's all you get. There's, I don't know anything about so, those so characters. Basically, They're inconsistent. You have these it's two characters. Thin. It's a shallow movie that's about two no, It's honestly characters. about all in that way, that it's super, right. super shallow, and people Keep are talking. just... <laughs> <laughs> all right, Dan. I loved watching you during that fight. <laughs> Can't help me out, Carl. Come on. I can't help you, Scott! <laughs> <laughs> I have to sit here. <laughs> oh. oh, Mark. <laughs> <sighs> La La Land's running time is 128 minutes, so that was good, Mark. <laughs> oh, I know how long. Uh, La La Brokeback La La Mountain won the Critics' Choice Award in 2006, not Crash. Crash won best the, won best, the best Oscar. picture Oscar. Yeah, I know, Oscar, but there was yeah. some confusion. I just wanted to make sure. Mance was talking about Critics' Choice. Oh, the Oscar okay. got tied up. Oh God, I just. Uh. <laughs> you really wanted to fight, huh? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, but I can't. So, uh, yeah, people watching at home, Nick Moore thought Nocturnal Animals may be the most overrated film of the year. Oh, that's uh, good Harry man. Lee. Uh, Harry Lee led the charge. Many, many people thought that it was Rogue One. They thought it was overrated. Uh, Tyler Myers uh, Tyler. agreed with uh, with you, Mance, that uh, Finding Dory was overrated. But for him, he thought it was Fences, too stagey, not cinematic. Mm, I, I would have agree. pulled more tweets, but my brain exploded halfway through the fight. <laughs> And I couldn't concentrate anymore. So I can tell you that uh, we have the poll. I have the results for you when you make your ruling. And uh, I want to talk about this with Mark for three hours. After oh, we'll do show. it after the fight if he's here. Uh, Look, I got to take my opinions out of it and listen to the arguments. Uh, I, I do think you made some strong arguments, Mark. You made me look at some of the parts in interesting ways. Because I, I do think, while, while I like the film, you have some good points. as to that She is kind of a hypocrite at the end. <laughs> it's, it's, it sort of is a little hypocrite. Uh, but, but I think you sort of uh, even you even sort of admitted it yourself at the end. Well, well, that's sort of Los Angeles. Like, there's just it, just because you didn't agree with it doesn't mean it's not great. And I think Scott gave me a lot of reasons why it's great um, more than I heard uh, why. And, and you even were talking about how bad Dory was. <laughs> uh, so I got to give it to Scott. Scott gets the point. Woo! Yay. But uh, very loved that discussion and loved hearing that take on La La Land because I do think, uh, as much as Dan's head's exploding, I think uh, it was an interesting conversation. I look forward to discussing that more in after the fight. Can Dan, maybe say, we'll do a little mini fight, you versus Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say I before we move forward, I am, I am so grateful to everyone in this room 
Except that me. the next question does not involve La La Land. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too. No, yeah, it just happened. I don't know how that happened. Mark, but it did. Actually, that was my choice. <laughs> that was my choice for the duo. <laughs> for you, brother. Seriously. All right, here we go. This should be fun. Uh, I'd like you guys to. Uh, what 2016 movie would you like to officially do over? Pitch me a new take on a movie that was not very good this year. We're back to you, Mark. Uh, what movie do you wish we could do over right? Um, I wish, I wish, I wish upon a star that someone could make X-Men Apocalypse a good movie. Huh. Um, yep. The X-Men series started all this and gave us all these great comic book movies with all these huge budgets and made us sort of the kings of Hollywood. And that's the fifth X-Men movie? The sixth? The sixth. sixth. The sixth X-Men. Sixth. Um, and arguably, even with all that talent involved, the least satisfying of them, even the Brett Ratner one, um, you know, Brian Singer killed on with the first one with no support from the studio. When you can, when you know all the backstory about how much money got taken away from him on that movie, and he made a movie that was successful in spite of the studio, that's great. X Men Two is arguably one of the top ten comic book movies of all time. Then you have X Men Three, less said the better. <laughs> then you have First Class, which on paper shouldn't have worked and was just a great. delightful, delightful movie. And even Days of Future Past started to get a little, a little bloated, a little muddy, but you had a really great cast and a lot of charisma. And Apocalypse just felt like having wedding cake with ice cream on it and honey and maple syrup and sprinkles and more ice cream and more cake and a pound of sugar. It was just too much and nothing was served by that movie. You had you had a lot of great people and the movie lo looks great. The designs for the most part work, but it's just a lifeless inert movie. It's just called X-Men stuff. They just have show you stuff on the screen. The villains don't do anything. The, his horsemen, Apocalypse's power is whatever it needs to be that moment in a scene. Um, the young, the young X-Men don't really work. You really miss Famke Jansen and Jimmy Marsden. Those kids are decent actors, but when you cobble them with green screen and powers, they just don't have, they just can't hold the screen. Uh, the one scene with Hugh Jackman reminded you how good these movies could be. And I have a deep abiding love for the X-Men as comic book characters and, you know, you know, just in the history of them and what they represent. And I love this, a lot of these, this franchise, but this movie was just so I kind of even hate the movie. I was just so disappointed because there's so much potential there that could be, and it just felt like because they gave him money, he spent every penny of it. Good, and I I'm, I want to hear how you maybe what you would have done differently, uh, Roth. Let's get your pick though first. So my pick is Girl on a Train, which should have been a great movie. I mean, this had all of the elements to make a great the Girl on the Train. Um, this should have been. A wonderful movie. They were riffing off Gone Girl. They were banking on the success of that film. They took a book that had terrific story, great source material, and there is a tremendous performance in this film from Emily Blunt. Unfortunately, had the wrong director. They just chose the wrong director, and I am convinced that if that had been adjusted, this film would have been as impactful, as popular, as captivating as Gone Girl was. Um, that, to me, is the type of movie that really does deserve a do-over, top to bottom, like, let's reset that thing and do it right, versus characters that could be told, well, we'll get into this later, in a number of different storylines. Scott, ahead. what's your okay. pick? Tate Taylor directed that, right? From and the I'm going gonna, gonna to talk about why Tate Taylor was the wrong choice and why it went so wrong. Okay. Uh, actually, I mean, that is a great choice. I almost went with yours, and I did go with yours, and I had to repick. So after giving it more thought, I thought, man, Suicide Squad, talk about a movie that had the most potential. It was the film that everyone was looking the most forward to seeing at the end of the summer, especially after Deadpool just knocked everybody's socks off. <coughs> and it was the one that fell the furthest short. It, if you took this movie, you put the DVD in your DVD player, it was so convoluted that if you put your DVD player on shuffle and played the scenes out of order, it would not have made a difference. Uh, it, 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 it should have been an R-rated film. It should have really gone for it. It would have been more fun. I mean, go big or go home. Uh, there was no one cared about the villain. There were too many characters. Half of them were boring. Uh, and listen, forget everyone else. Just make the film about Harley Quinn and make it a, a Margot Robbie as Miss Pac-Man movie. No, um, <laughs> that's still my legacy. Uh, but no, uh, Margot Robbie was the best thing about this film. More of her, less of everyone else. That's in development now, isn't it? Yes, it is. That All right, so, because I, I don't want to get into too much on why your movies sucked. Mm -hmm. 
noted, <laughs> stricken from the record. These movies are terrible. What I want to do is why? How does why do they deserve a do over? And what would be better as we discuss here um, over the other ones? So my thing with this question is this: is that I agree with what you're saying, Andy. I mean, to me, when I look at these two movies, the idea is like, okay, these are two movies that a lot of people, including yourselves, were disappointed by this year, right? However, having said that, you don't necessarily, and you just said it yourself, literally, you were like, forget about Suicide Squad, do a Harley Quinn movie. Well, they are. So you're not saying redo this movie, you're saying do a completely different movie with that character, because that's a character that can go into a different story. It doesn't need to be that story. When you're talking about doing a movie over, you mean that movie, that story. I would say the same thing is true for the X-Men, is that probably what you really want is to see a better X-Men movie. Actually, no. With Okay, well, we'll argue about that. Or why does it need to be Apocalypse, right? Like, why do we need to see that story done again? But but your argument, then, is you're based, you have a movie based on a book. Are you telling that you want them to change the book? The idea, no, no, no. Because they because made the book. Because the idea is to do the movie over. And what I would say is you have an amazing story. So you would keep, Are, the, you would keep the same cast and script with just a different director? To, the do-over is the director, 100%. Because if you look at it, Tate Taylor, you're right, directed The Help, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So... If you look at the help tonally, who on God's green earth said that this guy is the one to do a dark and gritty drama suspense movie? The problem, and the 90% of the critics of this film said it was melodramatic. Mm -hmm. have, you read the, have you read the book? The book is pretty melodramatic. And boring. Hang on, so is Gone. I mean, well, no, no, no. Gone Girls, actually, we can talk about that later. <laughs> melodramatic and boring. If you look at who they chose, he is steeped in melodrama, and it works for him when he is telling a story that is meant to be sweetly melodramatic and slow. It does not work for him when he's meant to tell a story that builds tension. Directors that, that's why Gone Girl works. It's because it's David Fisher. So why Fisher. does that deserve a do over, over Suicide because Squad versus Because it could be Buckles. awesome. It could be awesome. I think all you have to do. All of these could be awesome. I need more specifics. Awesome. Let's go to Mark. I, you have I, I an would amazing like... actress and an awesome character an intricate, tricksy, fun, unfolding story to watch. We really? You yes. didn't know who the killer was the yes. moment you saw the trailer? Yes. No spoilers. Hey. There's only three oh, people wait. in the movie. There's no possible reason that to tell a fun X-Men story, Apocalypse needs to be All right, Mark, to, to respond to that. The reason, the reason this, the, I would redo Apocalypse and do it with a rewrite would be Apocalypse, the Apocalypse story, these movies have been building out the history of mutants. So if you're going to have this franchise that crosses times and, and, and periods and jumps back and forth in time, doing the establishment of the mutants, they hinted at it in first uh, was Days of Future Past that, that Magneto was in the basement there because he killed Kennedy. Bring, expanding the history of this world makes a tapestry. What what made the X-Men, makes me the X-Men resonate with so many people is that any of us can have those powers. And, it, you know, gay kids relate to it, kids who are bullied relate to it, anybody that has a physical problem relates to it. And you can explain that and give this a depth and a history and give it a reality, a, a, a reality in a comic book sense by explaining the history of Apocalypse and these mutants can find Find out where they came from, and that is such an interesting character motivation to look at the the metaphor of the oppression throughout history. And there's a really interesting movie to be told with these characters in particular. And the casting, Oscar Isaac is a great actor. Just don't bury him in a blue shoebox for two hours. Make it use use these if you hire these people because of their acting abilities, let them act. Don't let the costumes act. I, I pull say, back on all the second unit special effects stuff. And X Men is about story. X Men is about characters. It's not about things blowing up. We get to those. And there's a story to be had here that we could reveal the history and the hypocrisies in dealing with being a mutant and use that as a metaphor for how divided and confused everyone is now. Maybe Correct. it's because I liked X-Men Apocalypse more than most people. Mm -hmm. I thought it was flawed, but I didn't think it was bad. Like X Men uh, Last Stand, that was bad. Oh, like I feel like yeah. I felt like I there was agree. there was a lot of good stuff to be had in Apocalypse. I just thought it was a name, little too. Name, name one thing. It what I that, liked. That was great. I'll tell I you liked. what was what I really liked about it. the beginning of the film, the whole setting up Magneto in an unforgiven type of situation where he's trying to reinvent himself and he can't escape his past. I thought Oscar Isaac was terrific as Apocalypse. He was scary when he puts all the missiles into space. I was like, well, this guy's like this guy's really really serious. Like he's a villain that I was not used to seeing. He like you really can't stop this guy. I also liked how the film was a throwback to the first movie in the sense that it sort of recruits all the X Men. You see them 
them working together for the first time. I liked all those elements of it. What I didn't like about it was it was a little too long, could have been tightened up, but is that worthy of a do-over? No. In terms of movies with expectations, yeah, a lot of people were excited about Girl on the Train because it was going to be the next Gone Girl, which it clearly wasn't. But I feel like at the end of the summer, because the summer was just one bad movie after another, except for Captain America, except for Nice Guys, and except for Star Trek, people were like really looking forward to Suicide Squad to save DC after Batman v Superman. Uh, I don't want to say underperformed. $900 million is pretty good, but it just wasn't like the great movie everybody wanted it to be. Everybody wanted Suicide Squad to be great. The expectations were huge. The potential was there. David Ayer is a great director, and it fell the furthest short, even further than Girl on the Train. I feel what you just said. I feel exactly what what you said about Suicide Squad, about the X-Men Apocalypse movie. I own all the X-Men movies. I think I even own the Brett Ratner one. came out of box. Um, (laughs) But with Suicide Squad, and Suicide Squad is a deeply, deeply, deeply flawed movie. But the difference for me between X-Men and Apocalypse and Suicide Squad are there's nothing in Apocalypse I would want to rewatch. There was nothing memorable. There wasn't a performance that shocked me. If all else fails, if it comes down to Apocalypse and Suicide Squad, Margot Robbie's performance in Suicide Squad made me go, holy shit, I want to see a Harley Quinn movie. Exactly. And there's nothing that made me want to see another X-Men sequel after this movie. And so I think that just on that alone, there is one. We're going to have Margot Robbie, Robbie or Robbie? Robbie. Is, Robbie is going to be playing Harley Quinn as long as Hugh Jackman played Wolverine. I hope she, so. She was a revelation. She, she could be Miss she, Pac-Man, too. Yeah. <laughs> well, o- only if the next Suicide Squad movie is a huge failure. Um, but I think, ulti- and I think ultimately, they made the book. They The source material, they shot the source material. Even if you get a different director, and that, even with the pacing, Absolutely it's, still, not sure. it's, still, it's still a, a book. Except book. as your final thought. Quickly, go ahead, Ruth. That is not true. Absolutely not true. The flaw in this movie is 100% the direction. They did not just shoot the story. You don't just shoot the story and tell a great sense movie. That's not what Alfred Hitchcock did. That is not what David Fincher did. You throw a Denis Villeneuve at this movie and you're going to have an awesome, Oscar-winning, great, fun, iconic suspense film, but you don't. Emily Blunt got screwed. It deserves another chance. There's a million different ways. What you described is literally every X-Men movie. It doesn't have to be that X-Men movie that's redone. This has to be this movie, this story redone. You just said yourself, you want to see Harley, not Suicide Squad. Neither of these movies are the ones that deserve a second shot, not the way that this one does. I I will say that that uh, Margot Robbie did steal the movie, but in the context, if you're going to remake Suicide Squad, this is how you do it. Tighten it up. Too many characters. Lose Killer Croc and Boomerang. Make Harley Quinn more of a main character. Change the stakes. Why do you have, oh, they're saving the world again? Make it personal. Who cares about Enchantress? Make the Joker the villain. Deepen the relationship between the Joker and Harley Quinn. There are ways to improve Suicide Squad. And that's it. I'm Enchantress. You have the eyebrows. Dan? <laughs> well, there are so many uh, uh, viewers at home. Uh, Mac Poole said that, uh, and this was the one that I saw, for most people, they thought that Batman v Superman could have used a do-over. Uh, Eric Monroe uh, voted for Assassin's Creed, put it in the hands of people who love the franchise, focus on what makes the games great. Evan Coyne said Independence Day Resurgence. Uh, no. Joshua Smith uh, <laughs> a- chose uh, another, a DC no. animated film uh, that I saw a lot, actually. Also, Batman the Killing Joke. He thought that the animated mm. film was a waste of it the returning voices. Yeah, and uh, Travis of Marvel, even though he was a, somewhat a fan of the movie, thought that he thought Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Out of the Shadows didn't quite get it right, but had all the elements he wished that they could redo it and get it right. Uh, some good choices in there. All right. Based on these arguments, came down to Mark for me. Mm. Mark got the point. Basically, you, you did prove to me, he, I think he did prove why Apocalypse, because that's the depth and the history of mutants, and the Apocalypse being the first mutant, obviously, brings a lot. And and you sold me your, the most, the thing that stood out the most was uh, nothing stood out in yours. As as worthy of uh, and to, to to complete read over, whereas the Harley Quinn debate that you sort of both tag teamed on to take yours down is do we need Suicide Squad? No, we need Harley Quinn maybe. Uh, so Mark, it's the the second point. You know we need more than Harley Quinn. Miss Pac-Man. Marco Robbie is Miss Pac-Man. <laughs> <laughs> Who's right, with me on this screen? Still, still, Mark, uh, Jonah, Jonah Hill is Mark the ghost. has made it to the <laughs> yeah. finals. Oh, Ross woo-hoo. and Scott, you need a point to make it. This is our last round. So before we go, before we go, I just want to say. I just want to say, as we move forward into this final round, 
I'm really dreading this. <laughs> Me too. I think this fun. is going to be tough. Uh, this is a long episode already. I can tell. Do you want to sit out since I'm already going in? Oh, wow. you, 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 you are an awesome you, fighter. You're allowed to do that awesome. unless you want an extra point in the finals. Awesome. I want to see Dan fight. You can fight for a point here. Take the point. Suicide Squad won the poll, by the way. Oh, did Suicide Squad? Well, why don't we see what happens? Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. The final question here from Daniel Lewis. What is the best movie of 2016? La La Land. Let's hear your movies. Yes, that means who went first last time? I do So, Roth, your favorite movie. Let's just say the movies. Manchester by the Sea. La La Land, baby. Moonlight. Ooh. Oh boy! All right, let's see this out. And I think uh, we'll in February they're all going to have their names called sometime. <laughs> uh, Roth, first up with Manchester by the Sea. All right. Why man. is your movie better than La La Land and Moonlight? Okay. Uh, let's take this out. We've talked about the, the the pros of these films a lot. Right. I don't need to keep re repeating it. Why is Manchester by the Sea better than Moonlight and La La Land? Okay, I will tell you why, and it's one thing that makes this stand out from these other two movies, and that is that this film is willing to do something. First of all, I would say as a whole, as an entire film, the way that it's constructed, it has all of the elements, right, to make a great film. But that's not why it is better than these other two films, which are great films. The reason why is because it does something that almost no movie is willing to do, and that is to take something and say, guess what? As much as every other movie is going to tell you that life includes redemption, that you are able to rise above all circumstances and find happiness and find a better way, there are some things that you will never come back from. They are irrevocable, they are damaging, they are soul destroying, and they will make your life hell on earth and you still have to get up every day and live it. What movie is willing to do that, to just present it to the audience and trust them to have their own emotional take on that? and not try to force anything, and not try to sell anything, and not try to paint life in a way that it's not. Oh. And not even try to end, as okay. much as I love Moonlight, on something that easily could have a dot, dot, dot. They moved to Brooklyn, opened a cafe, and it was amazing, which is my ending for that film. This movie says, guess what? They can't afford Brooklyn. It, 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 <laughs> in my world, they do. Guess what? It doesn't get better. Goodbye. That sounds fun. <laughs> it's a freaking brilliant Merry Christmas. Film. It is a bold. It is a bold. It is a it beautiful. Is bold. It, it is bold. It is bold. A Scott, well you're a bold. Bold. To try in the 21st century doing a love story where the lovers do not end up together, but you see what would have happened if oh, they on. did. That was bold. That's a cop out. See, it's the best of both worlds because see what would have happened if they did end up together. See what would have happened, that, that what really happened. It that has they commitment did issues. not. They are two people who chose ambition over love and it cost them their relationship. The very passion, the 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 passion that drove them together is the same passion that drove them apart. It is an exhilarating, magical, wonderful film. Lots of long, extended takes. Works as a throwback and as something current. Great chemistry. Yes, Mr. Mark Andrenko. Great fucking chemistry with Ryan Gosling and Emma Stone. They are the Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet of 2016. Yep, this movie sure is. Are. This movie is the singing of the rain. Oh, oh no! No! Oh, no. no. Yes, it is. He's a musical no, like no, no other. No, no, yes, it is. No, 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 best day. It is a movie that has to be seen on the big no, screen. No, 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 wait, hang no. on. It is a movie that has to be seen oh on the big God screen. It is a movie that just today, just today, one of my coworkers was watching the screener for La La Land, and she goes, 10 minutes into it, I stopped it, I went to the arc light because it was a movie I had to see on the big screen. You can watch, so she should be fired. You can watch Manchester. She left work. You, you can, you can <laughs> watch, technically, watching was work. You can watch Manchester by the Sea at home. It will be just as good. You can watch Moonlight at home. Bullshit. It will be just Bullshit. as good. Bullshit. La La Land Bullshit. is better. Bullshit. La La Land is better. Bullshit. La La Land is better on the big screen. Bullshit. It is a movie with a capital M. It is the best Bullshit. movie of the it year. It's going to win the Oscars. The it's going to win the Globes for Best Music. All right, Mark, you're going to give up your point. Are you going to do it? No. Fuck no. La La Land makes me love LA. I love La La Land. I love La La Land. Since we're just talking about why our movie is the best, I will not talk about that one. 
Come I will, on. I will acknowledge. I will acknowledge that Manchester by the Sea is a masterful film, and it's glad. I'm glad Kevin Lonergan is back because if you haven't seen Margaret, his movie before this. <sighs> It's one of the best movies that never Margaret's got a release. Great. It's so good. Mar- Margaret great. is spectacular. You can count on me is also great. Also yes, great. but Mar- yes. Margaret is arguably better than Manchester by the Sea. Uh, art. Da, da, da. Manchester by the Sea is a love is a really <laughs> elegantly made movie, but it is so bleak that for me, best movie means of something that I want to rewatch and something that will make me feel and like La La Land. Da, da, da. Which he did rewatch. <laughs> I saw it twice, <laughs> and it didn't get any better. It's like drinking sour milk isn't going to make so it. But so Moonlight different. has a better Moonlight, rewatch. Moonlight. Moonlight is a movie that on paper is about a young African American kid in the projects in Miami, surrounded by drug addicts, and he's gay and he's closeted. So I'm like, oh, okay, this is going to be a John Singleton lifetime movie at its best. It's going to be it's going to be really well made message movie. It is not about that at all. It is a movie unlike anything I've ever seen. It evokes Terrence Malick at his best. It's a very silent movie. It's a very beautiful movie. It's got characters that that on paper could be stereotypical and turn. It's got a richness. It, it, it is an audience member because it leaps from three different times from when he's 10 to when he's 16 to when he's in his 20s. It makes you keep up. It doesn't fill in everything. There's no big monologues that spell out what happened when the 10 minutes I wasn't on screen. You have to figure out things. The casting in this movie is transformational. You believe that this was these these people were, some, they somehow did boyhood with this, especially the casting of the non-boyfriend, boyfriend character in it. Um, it, was just a, it was just a tremendous movie. I literally wish they had ensemble Oscars because this cast is flawless. Naomi Harris is the only actress in it who plays the same character throughout the whole movie. And she plays the mom. And the emotional journey she takes you on as an audience member, you love her, then you, you're disappointed by her, then you hate her, then you understand her. This movie is so emotionally complex. And while it's a melancholy movie, it ends on such a quiet, gentle moment of hope that you have tears in your eyes, but not because you're sad, but because... It's almost like when you see after a volcano erupts and it's all ash and you see a piece of grass pop out of the bleakness. It is such a hopeful, beautiful movie. It's beautifully shot. It's beautifully made. The fact that this director came out of retirement to make this movie and this is what he... Please keep making movies because this movie is easily my favorite movie of the past five, maybe the past ten years. I think it transcends race. It transcends gender. It transcends orientation. It's a movie that anyone can watch and it's hopeful in, in the face of despair, whereas this is realistic and I thought the ending was spectacular because the ending was the real ending but the movie was just so bleak I can't ever imagine myself saying what am I going to do on my day off I'm going to watch Manchester <laughs> by the Sea that and not- that doesn't mean it's not a great movie but I think best implies a movie that you want to revisit you know the best movies of our life are I don't think that that is necessarily accurate because if I think about the movies that I am probably going to rewatch this year, they're not necessarily going to be, and that I often rewatch, they're not necessarily the movies that we consider the best movies of all time. Also, I don't think that a movie being bleak or having a dark stance means that I'm never going to watch it again either. I watch The Godfather all the time. That's when we a, think those about are the entirely greatest different series, films. Yeah, they are entirely different films, but what I'm saying to you is that the fact that it has a bleak tone does not mean that it is a lesser film. I watch Guardians of the Galaxy over and over and over again. I don't think it's the greatest film ever made. I just love watching it. Those two are not correlated at all. You do not see The question was best movie, not favorite movie. You do not see filmmakers willing to trust their audience the way that Kenneth Lonergan trusts his audience. They are not see filmmakers anymore that are willing to tell the story, a simple story, but a profound one at the same time and simply present it to you. And trust the actors and trust the story That's enough what they do with for you to absolutely it's the, exact, it's the exact same thing except I think Moonlight except that Moonlight also relies on having an unusual structure it relies on several things that Manchester by the Sea just does not need to sell the strength of this film and this oh, story the big, the big reveal of the tragedy that happens there and I'm not going to spoil and it's it like a is, just, is I already spoiled La La Land no 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 no, 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 no the, the big reveal no and the reveal the big reveal it's a, it's a testament once again to the strength of Michelle Williams, and I hope in a it's a tough year for Best Supporting Actress, but she would be she deserves one because she's a huge talent. But the, it feels it gets a little Book of Job in this movie. So much is heaped upon Casey Affleck, and you talk about structure. They, they lead you so through the whole movie much. about guess what happened, guess what happened, guess what happened. No. That reveals a big deal in the it's context of the movie. It's not so much, and the truth is, it's a thing. It's a horrible thing. It's a horrible thing that happened to him that ruined his entire life. It's not that it's one thing after the other, after the other, after the other. It's just this one thing is all it took. 
and it would. And, that thing would do that. And ultimately, I agree with you, but ultimately, our movies are very much similar. They're in both the, beautiful but, films. But, but as far as best film and a film that I that I would regularly want to revisit, and I've seen Moonlight three times already, the, 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 this, a film that I would and want I've to revisit. And I've seen Manchester more than that's once. That's great. I just think that a movie, historically, this movie... Is, he has the same sort of despair and lack of hope and horrible stuff that happens to this kid and to the people he loves, but it ends on a realistic, hopeful note. It's not a false ending. It's an ending where it, it can be bad when the sun comes up and the next I morning. Would argue and that I think that that makes it more timeless. I think this movie is a very hard movie to Quickly, watch. Quickly, because I don't get I, I would argue that the Thank exact you. opposite thing is true, is that they're both beautiful movies, but the thing that takes Manchester up by a notch and makes it the slightly better film is that it is willing to make that choice to show you the real ending. I think the the, real, no one does that anymore. Okay, uh, I, I, again... These three films are legitimately the three best movies of 2016. Those are one, two, and three on everyone's list, and they should be, they deserve to be. I love both of these films. It's going to be hard to argue against either one. I can only argue why I love La La Land more, because by the near the end of the film, when they're sitting at the park and they still, you still don't know where the movie is going to go, and then it flashes forward five years. You're like, wait, where is this going? It really took the movie to another height. You know, the fact that above all else, beyond just the musical aspect, the, the tribute to the musicals, the cinemascope, the, uh, 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 the uh, technicolor, the chemistry, beyond all of it, that two people can be in love with each other and still not end up together is honest. I've been there. I know the feeling. It happens. I like your jazz club, though. <laughs> Sebs. Okay, I mean, <laughs> it's a lot, but I, it's, I'm on the fence on a couple things. This is a good argument. Yeah, I know. It's I love to listen to it. It's better than talking about which <laughs> serious movie was better. Uh, let's do a closing arguments here, but again, give me give me your last final thoughts or something new to tell me why your film really is the best of the others. I uh, think, we'll start with you, Mark. I think if you're going to spend eight to ten to eighteen dollars to go to a movie theater. I think there are better musicals you could watch. I think that are more grand and more embrace. He did the CinemaScope thing at the beginning, but it kind of fell apart. It, he, he referenced stuff that never really went anywhere. I think this is a fantastic movie, and it's a beautiful piece of acting. I think that it's just, it's so bleak that I think sometimes bleakness is, is easier than trying to make a, a hopeful ending. And Moonlight, for me, of all three of these movies, I've never seen a movie like this in a theater before. It's just, it was an exhilarating experience. It completely defied every preconceived notion I had going in. It was, you know, when I, I saw the movie, the two days after it opened at the Arclight, at the Dome, it was sold out on a Monday. And when the credits rolled, the audience sat there in silence for like five minutes and were just like processing the movie. Was there a Q&A afterwards? No. Maybe that's uh, why they No, were there was no Q&A. And, <laughs> and it was, you so rarely see that. It's, you know, movies like Moonlight make me happy that I go, why, why I love movies to be in with that group experience. And, you know, it happened with Boyhood. It happens with most of the big budget blockbusters on an emotional, visceral level. But seeing the fact that in this day and age of movie studios only making $300 million movies based on IPs, seeing an original movie that is not only an original story, but is unlike any movie I've ever seen, I just think just on craft and quality and what it is, I think it's just a, a hair's breadth ahead of Manchester by the Sea. And I wish I could see the La La Land everyone else has. I, I really, wish you could I too. don't want to hate it, but oh, I really boy, hate I wish you could have seen that movie. I sat through the, the other movie I sat through the credits like that last night was Swiss Army Man. Uh, seeing the credits like that, like, wow. <laughs> I'm going to say this about, about, about Manchester by the Sea, about Moonlight. I love both of these films. They're number two and number three on my list. But are they movies that I'm going to watch over and over again? I might. Is La La Land a movie that I'm going to watch over and over again? Yes. And I've done it eight times. I don't do that. I don't have time to watch You a said movie. the same thing about Harold and Kumar, and you were bullshitting us. <laughs> no, I mean it. I mean, I mean it. This, I am telling the truth this time. No, seriously. I feel like La La Land is a movie that a lot of people are going to see over and over again. I also think that it's a movie that a lot of people are going to... to you know, it's a it's a musical for people who don't like musicals. It, it's also it's a musical for an It's hour. also a, mu a movie that might introduce people to musicals that they might not have otherwise seen. There's a lot going on in La La Land. I love Emma Stone. I fell in love with her even deeper watching this movie. I, I it's there's magic. It is magic. It is a movie with a capital ending with a capital M, and what an ending. 
Final thoughts? You know, the question here isn't what is the most rewatchable movie of the year, because that could be a million different things that aren't even on here, like the nice guys or Sing Street, I right? Movie, yeah. So, yeah, that's great. But the question isn't what is the most rewatchable movie of the year. La La Land's a lot of fun to watch, you know, not for Mark, but for a lot of people. It's fun <laughs> to watch. But that doesn't mean that it is the best movie of the year. And certainly, I really don't believe that in 10, 15, 20 years that La La Land is a film that people will be looking at in film studies classes necessarily. This isn't something that people are going to return to again and again. I do strongly feel that Manchester by the Sea is not only the best movie of this year, but it is a movie that people will return to. And they will look at the filmmaking in this film because it is understated, because it is subtle, because it allows the story to unfold. But at the same time, it is the opposite of La La Land, which basically gives you two endings because it can't commit to one. Oh, no, it commits it gives, to one. It, the it, it, can't commit to one. So it's it 100% conceptual. commits. It teases it one. Commits, Manchester by the Sea commits uncompromisingly to what it is. It is so beautifully executed. It is so gorgeously written. It's like a freaking jigsaw but, puzzle. But La La Land is not Clue. And then it's not Clue it doesn't matter. Ending, La La Land is a cute, fun movie. It's not really cute. It's Manchester by the Sea of these having, th- of these three movies, though, is the least cinematic of them. It's it a does, it's a no, stage. No, it's a beautifully not written true, movie. Not true. Not true. Not true at all. <laughs> Moonlight is beautiful and it's beautifully shot. Don't make me have you guys cool. seen the video of the little girl with the maracas? Yes. Like, no, no. Okay, not true at all. That's not true. I think that we confuse flash with cinematic. And we confuse flashy acting with great acting. We made that mistake again and again. If you walked out of Manchester by the street, your guts were on the fucking floor. If that's you walk a movie. out of La La Land, your heart was broken. That's a, yeah, because I you, spent I think eighteen dollars in two hours of my I life. I love La La Land, but you walk out of La La Land, and you feel pretty good, and you to. go have some pizza. You walk out of the Manchester right. by the Street, and you're destroyed for days. Yeah, that's go a, see Manchester by the Sea. Everybody, else. <laughs> someone you don't like, take him to see Manchester by the Sea. Wow, I, I'm sorry that took so long. Right, I was just I needed to hear a lot because that's they're all three. These are the three best films according to a lot of many people. Uh, Dan. Uh, I think that Manchester by the Sea is glad that Roth is not in charge of their marketing. That is, <laughs> that is a tough message to sell a pretty good movie on. It's like, you will feel awful. Your guts will be on the your floor. Your guts will be on the floor it's, with it's the popcorn. True. Remember you when Manchester your dog dies, you're going to feel that for two hours. Uh, yeah, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't really have anything. This, I, was watching, I was on the sidelines. Everyone's debating. We have a, critics, we have a, a, a poll out, but there's also a bonus poll called Does At Movie Man Slala Land Your Choices Are He Loves It Yes His Favorite of the Year and Unsure <laughs> Who? Um, What's going on? Uh, based on the arguments uh, Yeah there was something interesting about your I mean because you all are arguing great films you're all making good points as why your films are great but there is something I thought very interesting about Roth's argument about how Harder it is to do that, and then I think you said, "Oh, bleak is easier than hopeful." I just think that's it's not true at all. Oh, I, it's so much easier to say, "Oh, well, there's some hope at the end," and give you a little bit of a olive branch, right? So, uh, the fact that Roth's argument there of this, the fact that they had the balls to go so bold and still be so strong with it, um, it just gave me the slight edge of the over two. So I got to give it to Roth. Can I say? Even though it's not my favorite. Yeah, that was a, a strong, <laughs> strong passion came out of there. Yeah, Moonlight was, I love Manchester by the Sea and I meant everything I said and I think people should see the movie and feel like shit after. Um, but <laughs> Moonlight's actually my, by a hair, my favorite. All, and all I, that three, was my first that's pick. what's fun though. And that's then what, I love La La Land. I do. The best so part great. of it is when you oh, when you have choices. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and La La Land is All three of these are great and La La Land will win the Oscar, I'd say. Yeah, it will. So you win, you actually do will win, Scott, there in reality. But Scott, fantastic. Fantastic job. Have a round of applause for Scott, yeah. man. So close. Yeah. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, but Scott, I'm going to need your help we'll here uh, for this, for this, for these, uh, for speed round. For speed round, I'm going to need your help, okay? Let's do it. And, uh, Let's do it. Fans speed of the cow. Co- yeah, uh, here we go. Uh, fans of the cow. Now we're getting stupid. All the the way. Okay. Wait, can I just say one thing? Okay. Uh, this is the third time I'm going to interrupt this fight. Thing. That was freaking awesome. Yeah, it was great. That was a really good conversation. That was great. Yes. I, 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 I no mean, comic book this movies. This was the most passionate, arguing the best movies of yeah. the year. I would not have missed this fight for no, anything this was awesome. in the universe. It was that so was much fun. Great. 
freaking and awesome. All right, Andy. Sorry. Oh, I, it's only I, two. That's I right. Agree. So. And these are my top three like, movies of the year. I can't wait. Also, though, Dan, I can't wait to watch you. Dan, Mark, I mean, after the play. fight, I'm teasing after the fight. Dan, I, I needed you play. play. I need to right, right, jump choice. up on that table with you, man. Oh, I want to see it. All Come right, we're trying something silly here for our first speed round. Oh. Uh, is it? Do I have these right? Yeah, these are right. Okay, he just didn't do that. All right, we're gonna do a, a blind fight for the speed round. You're gonna have a small amount of time, but I'll give you time to process. I want you to each. Uh, wait, is it my doing this right? Yes. All right, pick a pick a movie. And uh, tell us what your movies are. Screen Nikki's hats. Moonlight. Manchester by the Sea. <laughs> wow, that worked out. <laughs> All right, for this blind fight, you must add minions to your selection <laughs> to make your film even better. <laughs> oh my god. How would you add minions to your film <laughs> to make it even better? Hold on, time will start. You have a speed, this is a speed round, so you still have only 20 seconds to make your pitch. Uh, 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 can you do I'm rock, ready. paper, scissors? Who goes? Uh, fine. Mark, you don't care. Go first. Um, I would do, since you said it doesn't say what context the minions have to be in, they have to be in the movie. I would have Chiron, when he's 10 years old, watching Despicable Me on TV. Oh, you And I would keep her. everything else the same. That's the only way. <laughs> that's the only way to take a movie of this sort of impact and import and not make it awful and, and demeaning. And this movie is so elegant and so beautiful. Did that, or give him a minions backpack or something. That's it. Uh, good luck, Roth. <laughs> he would never have a Minions backpack, ever. He would never, this is not the kind of kid that would be watching Minions. <laughs> You're totally destroying the reality. However, having said that, it came free the family cereal. that exists in Manchester by the Sea absolutely would have had <laughs> Minions on. This is the She's family thinking. that would have been having Minions on. Ten seconds, uh, yeah, Mark. So she basically took my idea and said, no, the white kids would be wearing the Minions <laughs> instead of the black kids. So. Ten seconds for Roth. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying well, imagine. That's exactly what you're I'm saying. saying the imagine the 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 surreal, disturbing Racist. juxtaposition. <laughs> How dare you, sir? The juxtaposition of having the minions flickering in the background and that. Oh, you know you lost that one. I, as as wrong as it was, I do sort of agree with her. Uh, Dan, what do you think? I, uh, I think Mark took that in a little landslide. That was a brilliant idea. <laughs> Uh, uh, Pants. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's probably it's probably true though that Michelle Williams, that family, would be watching it more. There was but, discount <laughs> Minions merchandise at the Goodwill. Yeah, it was that, because they're just, they're playing like the. No, uh, Mark. I, I get think it. he he had better taste in Moonlight. Is all my point. Uh, yes, but Mark Mark creatively took it first and you yes, barred you it. So while uh, interesting That's try there, broth. A hundred percent points. <laughs> I just pulled the La La Land and I Yay. lifted the scene. We're back and the and the yeah. no, no. Mark, you're ahead. <laughs> Your La dancing La was much better, though. I loved La La Land. <laughs> I loved it, Scott. By the way, Ross, I think you could have won if you would have pointed out that Minions probably didn't exist when the character in Moonlight was a yeah. kid. Uh, or if you had said it was a mascot at the yeah. par at a yeah. party. Yeah. You there, you go. there was ways you could. Or the Casey Affleck's kids could have been actual minions. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, oh man. Sure. Dude. Right. Here we go. Sorry. Here we go. Number two. Speed round, so speak quickly. That was okay, so here we go. Done. <laughs> uh, first, you have to answer your, que your question quickly. Ready? Worst movie of tw 2016. Allegiant. Look. Hold on. <laughs> oh God, there's so many to choose from. Um, Allegiant's a good one. Uh, worst movie. La La Land. Ah, I knew he was gonna do it. Yeah. <laughs> Come on! It's like sitting on a bike with a right, seat missing for crying out loud. That's exactly what that movie was like. <laughs> Rob first. This movie is so freaking bad that they actually decided to make the final film in the franchise a TV movie! That's how bad it is! This movie is so bad that it murdered the franchise dead! And they now are contractually obligated to being, bring the 15 people that will still watch this thing to television! This had Miles Teller, Shailene Whitley, it should have been a blockbuster. No one expected The Hunger Games for Dummies to be a good movie series at all. And especially after the third one with her and that bad Jan or, um, Mrs. Brady wig fighting crime or whatever they were doing in the hunger world of Allegiant. La La Land, I went into it. He's all the accolades. This is going to cure you. The skin, you're going to you'll be able to walk again. It was like going to a tent revival I was expecting. Ten seconds rough. Whatever you personally think about La La Land, you cannot possibly say it is 
objectively worse than Allegiant, which is objectively terrible. It is a boring, soulless if you, piece if you, of... If you buy filet mignon from the guy at the off-ramp, you're not expecting it to be good. La La Land is told, I'm told it's a gourmet meal and there was a hair in my fucking soup. It was a disappointing, overrated movie. Make it stop. Mance, I'll give you the, the liberty here. What point? Who would you like to give the point to Ron and Mark? Ross. <laughs> Come here, Dan, I, I think, yeah. Jonathan, are we in agreement here? Yeah. 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 I, I already written it down. <laughs> oh, just make it stop. <laughs> All right. Here we go, number three. It's tied again. Who gave the funniest performance of 2016? Ryan Gosling and the Nice Guys. Zach Efron and Neighbors. Two. Ooh. Interesting. Okay. Goss no one picked Ryan Reynolds. Gosling versus Efron. Okay. I would have picked Ryan Reynolds. Right. I, I thought I that's what you were going to say. I, I, Ryan Reynolds, <laughs> I can switch. No, you can't. <laughs> you got Gosling and the Nice Guys. Um, and I'm sticking with Gosling and the Nice Guys. Look, he is so underrated as a comedic actor. You go into that film and you cannot believe how freaking funny it is. And it's all because of him. Every actor around him that's even remotely humorous, it's because of the delivery of Gosling's lines. He is so much more talented as an actor. Look, Zac Efron's penis was hilarious in Neighbors 2. It was a really funny dick. <laughs> is this penis? I don't remember that. Oh, yeah, there's penis. No, it was a, no there it was is a, penis. It was there's a, balls. It was balls. It's there's balls. no penis. Balls. It's balls. It's balls. Those are two okay. different Sorry. things. It's balls. Fair enough. It was Sorry. Balls. Yeah. I think. Sorry, Mark, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we need to get you on uh, Christian Mingle or teach something. Teach me, Sarah. <laughs> hey, I'll teach me. Um, you know, Everything you got. it's really easy to write off Zac Efron, and I wanted to because of the whole Disney thing and that whole cult of personality that Disney grows, those little minions. And Neighbors was a very fun sort of throwback movie to the days of Ivan Reitman and Meatballs, so I went in expecting to not really enjoy Neighbors 2. Neighbors 2 is, is such a funny movie, and he commits to playing stupid so well. And playing stupid is like playing drunk. It's so much harder to do, and he does it masterfully. Yeah, look, I think he's a funny guy, and it, but it was a basically a repeat performance of the other film. You know, you're talking, you look at Ryan Gosling, and you look at two of the funniest performances of the year, and it's him, both in La La Land and in The Nice Guys. I would argue that Ryan, Reynolds, or Ryan Gosling's performance in Nice Guys was very much similar to the performance he played in La La Land. Oh, played, come on! He played that guy that was twitchy and evil, and I think that the, the, the movie might be slighter, but the performance is... Jonathan, Dan on the couch. I don't agree, but I have to go with Mark. He just gave me more. Dan? Ugh. Yeah, neither one of them really gave me a lot to cling on to. <laughs> uh, I think maybe Roth gave me a little bit more. Yeah. But it's, it's, I don't it's know. Just she likes uh, go ahead, Scott. Here's why Roth gets this point. Here's why she gets a point when she says that Zac Efron was a repeat performance from the first movie. That's all I needed to That's hear. what I got too, actually. Yes, we're, in, we're in alignment there. Roth gets the point. Four to three. Here we go. I like how you guys are like, you both kind of suck, but I guess. <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> Just stop with the La La Land jokes. <laughs> Help! Okay. Uh, best movie villain of 2016. Oh, God. I would say death. <laughs> no. Oh, come I on. Don't, <laughs> death. There were a I mean, lot of people who died. Movies, there yeah. were a lot of great movies where the where there weren't conscious. Best movie villain. No one's in Nepal at this point. Best yeah. movie villain. Oh my God! There were so many only okay villains this year. <laughs> Exciting round. <laughs> um, Fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> this wasn't a year. I'm of honestly like I, I five, villains. four, three, two. One. Okay, no one gets the point. What are they saying on the internet? Yeah, what are they saying on the <coughs> internet? We can't steal those. No, I'm yeah. just curious. Uh, there were... So, Andy, does that mean that we skip this question entirely, or are we just coming I up with a new... So, so right? this would be the decisive question yes. if we skip Single that question, and this Captain is the America decisive Civil question. Yes. Oh, God, no. Here we go. <laughs> oh, Another La La Land question? Jesus. Please, God, uh, not stop. <laughs> I mean, do we have... Here we go. Ready? Yeah. Deadpool or Civil War? Deadpool. Deadpool. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you never thought I'd take Roth, Deadpool, did you? We're off got Deadpool. So, Mark, you need to get this point to sure. elicit a tiebreaker. Okay. Look. Uh, wait, I've got them tied. So, this is the definitive point, then, whoever wins this. Uh... No, I had Roth ahead by two. 
No, Roth's only ahead by one. Four, three. Did you? She I missed a point somewhere. She, oh, yeah. Uh, Mark no, won I'm the sorry. first, and then Roth won the last two. I misread that. I apologize. Yes. I just want to make sure the integrity uh, of the scoring no, system. No, thank you for back. double checking. Uh, yes. But Roth got uh, yes. Deadpool, and then Mark, you'll be arguing Civil War. You'll need to get this point to a list of tiebreaker. Go yes. ahead, Roth. Okay. Look, Deadpool absolutely is the blockbuster movie of this year. Nobody can deny that. First of all, it was the little underdog that could. This is a movie that is made of passion. How often do we see a blockbuster movie, a superhero movie being made of pure passion. It captured the character. It was a comeback story for this man who's been trying to get it made for so long. He killed it. They killed it. Civil War took the, tr the old trope that you can have, there's too many characters in a movie and proved it wrong. If you have good characters, well cast and well written, yes. And it took a franchise that has been rebooted twice in the past decade and made Spider-Man exciting again by going back to what made Spider-Man simple. It was a movie that not only was a Captain America movie, it was an Avengers movie, it was a Iron Man movie, and it was a Spider-Man movie, and it served all of them well. This is a movie, though, that didn't need all of that. It had less resources, one character, a very simple story, and relatively low stakes. It was basically, don't call me Francis, and I want my hot girlfriend. And it was also, it played against it's the tropes of the comic book genre. All right, she got more time, so give him a, a couple extra seconds. It's hard to call, call a movie that had a $70 million budget, the little movie that could. And there's one performance in that movie that holds the movie together, Ryan Reynolds. He makes that character work. The rest of it is interchangeable. That sort of comedy is so zeitgeisty that those don't travel well sequ to comedies that blow up like that are always... Who, Mance, based on the arguments. Based on the argument, I gotta go with Civil War. Yeah, that's where I'm leaning, based on the arguments, Dan. And Draco won me over in the rebuttal. In the, in the rebuttal, yeah, yeah. I gotta go as well. In the Ryan Reynolds versus thing. Okay, there we go. Well, uh, we're tied, so... Oh my god. Here we go. This is gonna be longer still. I should have killed it with Deadpool. I had better arguments than that. All right. Okay, uh, I'm gonna make this broader than give you the duo, Okay. Most useless member of the Suicide Squad. Oh, and Slipknot. Yeah. Yeah. You're giving yeah, up? No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> There's um, more. Uh, the movie knows he's the worst. Well. Shh. Just, okay. Useless. Was she, was Enchantress technically originally? Yes. Yeah, Enchantress. Let's go Enchantress. There you go. We got Slipknot versus Enchantress. Ready, Mark? The movie even knows Slipknot's an awful character. They kill him 10 minutes into the movie because he does nothing but tie knots. He's like, he should have been called Boy Scout Man. Boy Scout Man. Uh, the Enchantress, well, horribly portrayed and kind of a device. If she's not in the movie, the movie even has less of a reason to exist. She's the driving force of the movie. She manipulates stuff. That might not be satisfying, but that's the case. If you pull that out of the movie, there's nothing there. Look, the fact is that nobody even remembered that he was in the movie, so he's not the most useless member. He's just the fastest dead member. Enchantress is the most useless member because she actually doesn't even do what she's supposed to do and be a part of the Suicide Squad. She doesn't even turn around and do that well. And what she is, then what she does, be a villain, she does very poorly as well. This could not be more useless. She doesn't succeed as a villain. She doesn't succeed as a My hero. My character is so useless that even within the world of the movie, they know he's useless and get rid of him as soon as they possibly can. The Enchantress, while she's not a great villain, and most of these superhero movies don't have a great villain, is the villain. She's not only not a great villain, she's a terrible villain, meaning she's terrible doing? at what she does. She doesn't even villain well. She doesn't hero well. She doesn't villain well. She can't do either. Slipknot just doesn't even That's exist. It. That's not a useless right? character. It's a non-character. Oh, right. You got a few seconds, okay. sir. She survives the movie, so she does something well. Slipknot doesn't. That, I think, says it all. Can I call this? Scott, go ahead. Roth wins. Why? Because when she said <laughs> that his character dies so fast, it's not even like a crucial character, but you don't care He's about on the poster. at all. No. The, the poster, but not really in the movie. She made the stronger point about her character being in the film and useless. Dan. I was going to go with Andrejko. Personally, because uh, I think that uh, I see what Roth was saying, but uh, I don't know. I think that Mark, you know, said that she still has a role to play in the film, whereas his character had no role to play in the film. So for me, that's what I that's what I connected with more strongly. Yeah, I bet. I mean, it's it's tough because I think there was an argument you could have made there, but I didn't hear exactly because so I, based on what you what I heard. I gotta also agree to give it to Mark. Oh. Mark wins! Mark, Mark. 
Mark wins. Well Mark wins. Well Mark has one though. point. Look at that, we, baby. We will Keep discuss this there. in more detail after the fight. Scott has one point. <laughs> one point. <laughs> well, because they all this get was, extra points in the end. <laughs> I got to say, this is, a great way, this is a great way to start out the year with you guys, because I always like the fun, goofy ones, but actually being able to talk to people who are passionate about film, even if we don't agree, if you can articulate what you don't like or what you like, it always engages you and expands your brain. So this was this was great, you guys. This this was was so and fun. speaking of love, because I love all you guys, make sure you go pick out Mark's uh, book, Love is Love, available. If you can't I, I, find it at a comic book store, go to Amazon. They will have, they have them. Great in. cause, amazing book. Please go, everybody go pick that up uh, for on our behalf for Mark. Roth Cornette, anything you'd like to plug? Uh, yeah, watch Screen Junkies, watch Screen Junkies News, Screen Junkies all day long, all the time. Mark will be there, Scott will be there, Andy will be there, Dan will be there, all of the humans will be Guys, there. Yeah, I'll be there tomorrow. And actually. I will be beating myself for blowing the Deadpool point. I should have had that damn point. <laughs> Scott, man, it's anything you'd like to plug. Just to follow me on Twitter and Instagram, I have great news. I finally got Movie Mance back on Instagram. It's wow. not about Movie Mance anymore, so follow me on Twitter good, and Instagram. Good word, yes, pull. Movie Mance, and to make sure you catch me on Access Hollywood and Access Hollywood live at AccessHollywood.com. And if you watch this show before tonight's Golden Globes, catch me hosting the Red Carpet Arrival Show on Twitter, the Golden Globe Who are you wearing? Who are you wearing? I am not asking that question. No, you know who I'm going to ask that question no, to? He's asking, no, who, who are you wearing? Who are you wearing? Oh, I'm wearing the, the tux I got married in. <laughs> Hugo Boss. Wait, I cannot wait to ask Tom Ford, who are you wearing? Uh, That's what I want to ask. He's going to punch you in the shin. (laughs) Uh, Thank you, Dan on the couch, Dan Merle at Merle Dan, Dan's Labyrinth every Monday at 4 p.m. And to our fans, uh, they'll be fighting tomorrow, if you're watching this live, they'll be fighting Friday, uh, which is what date? What's today? Friday the 6th. Uh, If you're watching live, tune in tomorrow at 3 p.m. live, or you can watch it over the weekend, screenduckies.com. It'll be... uh, up for anyone to watch. One of these three will make it to the next round to see fan fights here. Good. I hope you had fun watching. We will talk more about all of this on After the Fight, so stay tuned and watch us over here on Plus. Thank you guys so much. What a wonderful week. Start the year. Here's to 2017, everybody. Bye bye. Happy New Year. Every podcast we put on YouTube comes with this kick ass graphic listing all the topics your favorite Screen Junkies podcasters are talking about. If you click the topics, you can skip around and choose your own podcast battle royale. Go ahead, try them all. If you haven't already, subscribe to Screen Junkies on YouTube to join us for future fights. Or if you prefer to listen on iTunes, click the logo to download an audio version. 